he will be a staff for the righteous with which for them to stand and not to fall. And he will be the light of the nations and the hope of those whose hearts are troubled. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship him, and they will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. First Enoch chapter 48, verses 4 through 5. The modern world doesn't acknowledge, but is nevertheless haunted by spirits, angels, demons, and saints. In our time, many yearn to break free of the prison of a flat, secular materialism, to see and to know reality as it truly is. What is this spiritual reality like? How do we engage with it well? How do we permeate everyday life with spiritual presence? Orthodox Christian priests Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung host this live call-in show focused on enchantment in creation, the union of the seen and unseen as made by God and experienced by mankind throughout history. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits. Good evening, scorpion and serpent stompers. You are listening to the Lord of Spirits podcast. My co-host, Father Stephen DeYoung, is with me from Lafayette, Louisiana, and I'm... Get over here! (laughs) You Sorry, I heard reference. Scorpion. Wow. That's a blast from the past right there. <laughs> Please don't finish me. Uh, <laughs> Brutality. Yes. And anyway, I'm Father Andrew. I'm an Emmaus. You know that. If you're listening to us live, you can call in at 855-AF-RADIO. That's 855-237-2346. And Matushka Trudy should be taking your calls. And we will get to them in the second part of our show. Lord of Spirits is brought to you by our listeners and also by Chrysostom Academy. A lot of you listeners out there work from home. We know that. If you're telecommuting, you could probably live almost anywhere you like. If you're a parent of school-age kids and you're like me, working from a virtual office, then one of your big considerations for where you live is where your kids go to school. I love living in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania. Part of why is because my kids go to Chrysostom Academy, and it's a pan-Orthodox classical school with elementary through high school students. It is on a beautiful 55-acre wooded campus with a creek running next to it. It has the highest academic standards, and it is focused not just on educating the mind, but forming the whole person in Christ. So if you don't live here yet, think about moving to the Lehigh Valley and sending your kids to Chrysostom Academy. And even if you don't telecommute, our local economy is growing and it's producing jobs. So maybe one of those could be for you. We've got eight Orthodox parishes in our metro area. You can visit chrysostomacademy.org to see what I'm talking about. Also, you do, you do have to be a little careful there because because I'll be the I, I, Well, no, this this time of year, the whole you know peeps production is ramping up. <laughs> That's true. So just be a little careful that <laughs> you're not make... taking an Easter-related peep temp job. Yeah, they do make peeps. That, uh, that might not and... stick around for you. It's absolutely true. We are the home of peeps. Uh, also, though, we are still selling tickets for the Lord of Spirits Conference on October 26th through 29th, 2023. Right now, only commuter tickets are available because we have sold out the lodging at the Antiochian Village. You maniacs. You can go to store.ancientfaith.com slash events to get your ticket. And there actually aren't even that many left. So get a move on. You can like sleep in your car in the parking lot, take kind of a sink bath. There are these (laughs) bathrooms across from the the, uh, dining hall. Please don't do that. (laughs) Go goblin mode on the whole whole conference. (laughs) Please don't do that. Uh (laughs) I just said I just said someone could. I didn't could, say they yeah. should. Please don't. Just, yes, right. they could. They could do a lot of things. Yeah. Um, right. So, Orthodox Christians around the world were collectively puzzled when it was announced on social media recently that King Charles III of the United Kingdom and 14 other Commonwealth realms what at, was at his upcoming coronation going to be anointed with chrism that had been blessed by the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem and also the Anglican Archbishop in the same city. In between the hubbub and guessing games over whether what happened was some kind of con celebration, some might have been startled to discover that the word chrism turns out to be usable for any kind of anointing oil, not just the kind used at baptism. Does this mean that Charles is going to be anointed the Byzantine emperor? Yes. We will leave that. 
<laughs> we will leave that to the excitable to debate right after Father Stephen just gives away the answer. No. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Come on. It turns out, though, that we at the Lord of Spirits podcast, we're already going to be talking about the making of kings. So thanks, King Charles. Thanks, Patriarch Theophilus. And thanks, Archbishop Hossam Naum for the alley oop. So where does kingship really originate anyway, Father Stephen? Is it divine now, right of kings? Is it prime nature? We should clarify, right, that th there actually was not a con celebration. No, I didn't see any actual photos of a if, con celebration, but people were. Well, there's crazy. actually video. There's video of the whole thing on the TikToks. Uh -oh. So you just have to find a Zoomer to show you the TikToks and you can see the whole thing. I've been avoiding TikTok very carefully. Um, and uh, yes, so as far as I could tell, the, the Anglican Archbishop was primarily there to convey the blessed oil back to uh, Great Britain. That's nice of uh, him. Yeah. Um, so, and, and the reason for that also, by the way, is that... Uh, Charles's father, Prince Philip, was part of the Greek royal family. Yeah, I mean, he was an Orthodox Christian, although he, he became Anglican, of course, when he, he was I think sometime before he married. Required to by law. By law, yeah, yeah right. If you want to marry this particular <laughs> person, you have to become Anglican. Yeah. But uh, Charles's grandmother, though, she ended up her life as an Orthodox nun. So how about that? Yes, yes. And the olives were taken from... Used for the oil were taken from a grove near where she's buried on the Mount yeah. of Olives. Very nice. So that's why the Patriarch of Jerusalem was involved in all this at all. So technically, Charles is also a descendant of the Greek royal family um, on his father's side. Because um, otherwise, no one's going to listen to what we say. They're just going to be vexed by the pan heresy of ecumenism and I know. won't be able to take in the knowledge that we're, we're about to drop. Um, so also I wanted to note because I know our last episode was a little bit brain breaking um, that once we are done with our sacrament series, which I mean, that could be a while, right? We're at eight and counting, but once we are eventually are done with the sacrament series, we are going to return to this topic of the soul. So hang on, everybody. Talk about what it means to become a spirit. That's the teaser. Oh man, I'm gonna drop out there. Um, but so now back to uh, back to kings. Back to uh, tonight's topic, which we'll invariably get to in the third half or near there too. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, the anointing of kings in the episode in which we talked about the Messiah the concept of the Messiah, right. um, which we, exactly. I'm sure we had a clever title too, but I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> yes. Cause that's what Messiah means. It means an anointed one, the anointed one. And so we talked about, and so within that we talked about anointed Kings. Uh, but so in tonight's episode where we're talking about one of the sacraments, one of the Holy mysteries, of the Orthodox church, which is the consecration of the emperor, uh, that's where this is going. Um, we need to start by sort of revisiting, obviously the, the right of the consecration of the emperor has its beginnings in the consecration of Kings and in kingship itself, right? Which begins the old Testament. And so if you're following your generic Lord of spirits episode planner, uh, <laughs> we're starting at Genesis one. Hey. Um, so, surprise, surprise, surprise. Yes, everyone is shocked. Um, and um, technically, we're, we're starting in Genesis 2, verses 1 and 2, really. That's but, true, because this is um, Sabbath, Sabbath stuff. Sabbath stuff, right. And so we've talked about this before on the show that, and this is potentially ruining Sunday school, that, you know, the way we tend to think of you know, on the seventh day, uh, the Lord completed his work and he rested. We tend to think of that in terms of like, wow, that was tough making a whole universe in 
six days. So now I'm going to take a break. <laughs> um, and of course, that's not what's going on. <laughs> right? God did not need a break. But when it refers to God resting, that is him resting, meaning being seated upon the divine throne, right? To preside over now his creation, which he has completed creating. Uh, and so this theme of kingship, of God is the king over creation, starts right there at the get-go. And so we talked, we've talked about before how the Sabbath then, the weekly Sabbath, the Sabbath year, right, that the Sabbaths that were commanded in the Torah were for Israel to participate, not in God taking a break, but to participate in the kingdom, right? To, to participate in God's reign. That's why it was at the end of the week, right? Because it was pointing forward, right? To, to the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, right? Um, so that, that kingship is established there. And the way in which the the Torah itself and several significant portions of the Torah function are, and I know we've talked about this before on the show, but um, we need to come back at it again from this angle, is as uh, covenant documents. Right. Uh, we talked about the, the Hebrew word is berit, uh, the Greek word is diatheke, uh, that often gets translated... In English now as testament rather than as covenant. And so a lot of folks have a bifurcation in their brain where when you say Old Testament, New Testament, they think about divisions of the Bible, right? right. Like part one and part two of the Bible, when really that means Old Covenant, New Covenant, right? Those right. are the same terms, right? And so the Old Covenant, the original covenant, right, <laughs> the is is a um, covenant document, and not just in general, but of a particular type. When we hear covenant, uh, we tend to think of like, oh, well, it's like a contract. It's like an agreement, right? If we hear the word testament, we think like, oh, last will and testament. It's like a legal document. Uh, but the actual pattern in that we see in the Torah and in significant sections of it is patterned after a particular type of sort of treaty document from the ancient Near East. And we found a bunch of examples that match up really closely uh, in Hittite documents. Mm -hmm. A lot of these are written in Luvian, but they're, <laughs> they're Hittite, Hittite documents. They're what are called suzerainty treaties or suzerain vassal treaties they are a type of treaty document that was issued by a king to his vassals. So yeah, this some, king is now lesser. Right. So this king is now taking control of a number of cities. He's like the great king. Those cities have their own rulers. But now since he's in charge, he can now give his terms to those rulers who are now under his authority. And the particular pattern uh, in broad strokes, we won't go too deeply into this right now uh, tonight, but in, in broad strokes, the pattern is that those begin with an identification of the king, of the great king, uh, and a sort of historical recounting of who he is and what he's done, and particularly what he's done on behalf of uh the vassal, then it outlines uh, the vassal's responsibilities, his duties, right, to the great king. And then at the end, there is a section of here are all the good things that will happen if you do what you're supposed to do. And then here are all the bad things that will happen if you don't do what you're supposed to do. Right. Uh, and one of the really obvious places where you can see this pattern within the Torah is in the Ten Commandments, what we now call yeah. the Ten Commandments, uh, which are in Exodus 20 
and then again in Deuteronomy 5. And those begin with, right, I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, right? So here's who I am. Here is what I have done for you. Now, here are your responsibilities. You have no other gods before me. You will not make a graven image, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, it's less obvious in the Ten Commandments, right? The the blessings and curses, though there there are a few listed in there, right? That you honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that Yahweh or God is giving you, right? So there are some contained. But if you want to see sort of a very full example of this pattern, the entire book of Deuteronomy follows this pattern. The book of Deuteronomy begins with a historical sort of prologue. In the middle, it has commandments, and then it ends chapters 28 through 30 with a series of blessings, if those are kept, and curses if they are not. Yeah, which we talked about that in some detail in the Blessings and Curses episode. Yeah, <laughs> so... Um, but so this is the pattern. And so the very pattern within which God first reveals himself to Israel here in the Torah is following this pattern of presenting him as the great king. Now that said, that said, uh, we are, so most of the folks who listen to this show, there are a lot who don't, but the majority, the simple majority are in the United States. Um, another big chunk are in uh, the UK and Commonwealth countries. You know, the show's in English, so that will tend to happen. Um, and we have a chunk of Australians. Yes. <laughs> that's, we do. We have a, Australians yes, who listen. Which Probably is a not Commonwealth live. country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. And so in, in all of these places the popular Christianity, as it were, is either Puritan or heavily influenced by Puritanism. And Puritanism is not overly fond of kings. America is, of course, <laughs> worse about this than the other places I mentioned. Right? It's but, kind of our, our whole founding deal here in America. Yeah. We're not quite as bad as the French, but uh, it is kind of our raison d'etre. Yeah. Um, and so that has colored the way a lot of us have been taught the Old Testament, where it is very much presented as if before a few chapters into the book of Samuel, uh, Israel was sort of ruled directly by God as king, and that's how things should have stayed. But man, those no good Israelites, they demanded a king from God and that was bad and he gave them one. And then, you know, David shows up and is really good at it. I don't know how that works into the narrative, but um, <laughs> the, um, but that's very clearly not true if we, if we read carefully, right? Because as we just mentioned, the whole book of Deuteronomy is patterned at, in, in the form of this treaty from the great king, right? Um, the references I'm making here are deliberate. Let the listener understand. Um, and But Deuteronomy contains within it, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 through 20, which are explicitly commandments aimed at the human king who is going to reign over Israel. Which there isn't one for a while yet. There wasn't one for a while yet, but so yeah. this was not something unforeseen by God. <laughs> yeah, they haven't entered the promised land yet, but this is kind of on the verge. Yes. That's when Deuteronomy is delivered. The idea that there will be one particular vassal that not only are all of the Israelites or the Israelite elders or the prophet or a judge are vassals who are receiving the, the Torah, but that there is going to be one particular vassal king who is going to have particular responsibilities above and beyond the responsibilities given to other Israelites is right here in the middle of right, the statement of the old covenant, right? So 
that of course raises the question of what is going on then in like first Samuel or first kingdoms eight. Right. And we talked about this in a previous episode a little bit. Um, but just to right repeat it here, at least in summary, um, the problem wasn't that they wanted a king. The problem is that they wanted a king like the other nations. Yeah. And specifically. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, who's going <laughs> to lead them into battle because like they weren't winning the way they wanted to. And so that's like, well, we need to get one of those kings because look how, how winning they are. Right. You know. So they had just suffered this defeat where they said, hey, we're going to go into battle just of their own decision. And we're going to take the Ark of the Covenant out in front of us. And then we'll win because we have the Ark of the Covenant. So God will make us win. Right. Yeah. And of course, that didn't work out so good for them. And they lost the Ark and everything. Yep. But rather than getting the message <laughs> that they were supposed to get from that, the message they got was, well, I guess we can't count on God to help. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and, and we, this, I mean, this yeah. is one of the big themes in the scriptures of like, you know, do it yourself. That doesn't work out well. You know, like I have my yeah. own plan. I have my own ideas, despite what God has said to do. Like just. Yeah. Yeah. Don't and this do com- compounds it because this is, I'm going to go into business for myself. And then when it doesn't work out, I'm going to blame God. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so. Um, and, and so this is what's going on there. And this is why God says to Samuel, right, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me, right? Um, this is the problem there. Um, not that, that they were going to have a king, right, in general. But so that passage in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, sort of lays out, right, here are the particular commandments directed at the king. This is who the king over Israel is supposed to be and what he's supposed to do and not do. Yep. So um, I'm going to read this and it's, it's not one verse. It's a few verses. So listen closely, everybody. Starting with verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord, your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. So there's a, I mean, there's a few things there that are certainly different from the kind of the kings of the nations. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so, first of all, there's the king has to be an Israelite. Yeah. Uh, they can't decide like, hey, King of Moab seems to have it going on. Right. Let's <laughs> let's just become vassals of his. Right? Yeah. Right. Um, and, uh, the thing about the horses, right. Acquiring many horses. It's not just that like Kings collected horses. That's obviously both a mark of wealth, but primarily, um, cause it's going to talk about silver and gold. This is military power. Yeah. Right. They didn't have fighter jets. They didn't have tanks. <laughs> they had horses that pulled chariots. Right. Um, and so uh, temptation to go back to Egypt to make some kind of deal, uh, temptation to uh, just in general build a large standing army. Because what's that going to do? Well, we've talked before about Deuteronomy and the laws regarding warfare. They're not supposed to be committing offensive warfare. Yeah, no conquering to increase their territory. 
yeah, they're not supposed to be trying to set up the Israelite empire, right? Which is, <laughs> which take is over the world. again, crazy <laughs> in, in the ancient world's terms. Like, of course you would do that if you could. Like, that's what. If you could, yeah. Everyone, oh, yeah. Everyone did. Yeah. There's no the United Nations, itself. you know, passing yeah. <laughs> resolutions telling you, please don't do that. <laughs> or else right. we'll say, please don't do that again. Right. And um, obviously acquiring many wives, right? We know where that's going to go with uh, Solomon and even with David, frankly. Um, and trying to to obviously hoard great wealth, right? Rather, right, as opposed to all that. So that's kind of a picture of what the other nation's kings were doing. Rather... He's supposed to make a copy of the Torah for himself. Yeah. Which means he needs to learn to read and write in order right. to be able to study specifically the Torah. Yep. Got to be. And that approval by the Levites, right, um, means that it's not just, again, he's not – here's the scriptures go into business for yourself, right? Where he could use it to justify whatever he's going to do in his rule and that kind of thing. But he's being guided by the priests. He is under spiritual authority, even as he is the highest uh, uh, governmental authority underneath God himself. Yeah. And, and they're probably checking to make sure that he actually copied it right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, okay. And it says, you know, this law, right? So, I mean, that's a whole copy of the Torah. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then that is because the express purpose is that in learning the commandments, in keeping the commands, in following the way of life that's outlined in the Torah, his heart will not be lifted up above his brothers. Right. Yeah. Again, very and, different from the kings of the nations. And so not only is he not to do these sort of material things in terms of wealth, military power, wives, right? Um, but he is not to, even in his heart, right? Even, even in his own thinking, think himself better than the other Israelites, right? He has this particular role, but he is not better. And this is especially important when you consider that the kings of the neighboring nations, including Pharaoh back in Egypt, were worshipped as gods. Yeah. They d most definitely were above the rest of the Egyptians. Right? <laughs> Pharaoh was a god. His family, they were divine. That's why there was so much intermarriage, shall we say, within the royal families in all of these city-states and in Egypt, uh, because you couldn't marry a commoner because they were just humans, right? And so this is a dramatic departure from that, right? So the king is, is not sort of another class of being. He is not a higher being. No. Right? It's not like not the a... Sumerian kings list where the kingship comes down from heaven. Yeah, he's not a demigod. He's not... A son of a god, none yeah. of that stuff. He is well, son of God does become a royal title, but in a different sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> That's, yeah. Right. Um, and so he is essentially the eldest brother, right? The other Israelites are his brothers. He is just sort of the eldest brother. And so a lot of people will say that Saint Paul. Right. What one of the issues people have with St. Paul is that when you read the Gospels, especially the Synoptic Gospels, Christ is constantly talking about the kingdom. There's all this kingdom language, king language, right? And then people will say, well, St. Paul doesn't use that language, right? And while you can make that case if you're just going by Greek words, conceptually, when St. Paul is using the language of Christ as firstborn among many brethren, of Christ as the Son of God, and our adoption as sons and heirs of God, right? This is 
appealing to the way in which covenantal inheritance was understood. The eldest brother inherits everything and then distributes it right. to the other heirs. And so in the same sense, the king is functioning as this elder brother. He has these particular responsibilities before God. He is sort of the vassal of vassals, right? But um, he is an intermediary figure in the sense of having an added set of responsibilities both toward God and toward his brothers. Uh, not as being a special class of human or more than human. Right. right. So after Deuteronomy, you get Joshua, where Joshua sort of carries on uh, Moses' role, which is uh, a sort of kingly role in the sense that Joshua is the one leading into battle. Joshua is the one, as Moses had, um, who is in charge of the various judges and elders of the people and that kind of thing. Uh, but then you get into the book of Judges proper, and there is this refrain over and over again that in that day there was no king and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And which is not, this is, which a, is not to say yeah. like, you know, it was this beautiful f anarchic freedom. Yes. <laughs> and everything was yes. great. Sorry, anarchists. Um, <laughs> that's, in judges, at least, that's not a good thing. Right. right. That, that's that's everything's a mess. Right. And and how how is that working within the book of Judges? Well, we've talked before a lot about what justice is biblically. So justice Mishpat, right, is when everything is in its proper place, everything is related properly to everything else, and everything is functioning peacefully and appropriately and in good order, right? That's justice. And so since we don't have someone doing that, we don't have a person who's sort of maintaining justice, establishing the state of justice and then maintaining it, you get this series in judges of escalating cycles where Israel or in judges, usually some part thereof, some tribe or tribes within Israel fall into disobedience. Uh, and then come uh, it, it, because of they fallen into disobedience, God removes his protection from them and they get conquered by some outside force. Midianites, Philistines, whomever, Moabites. Um, and then God raises up a judge who doesn't hear any cases, right? The judge's job is to judge, meaning to reestablish justice. He comes in, overthrows the oppressors, and then the cycle repeats. Mm, yeah. And as you go through the book of Judges, the cycle gets worse and worse and more and more violent and bloodier and bloodier. And the deliverance gets shorter and shorter and more and more partial, right? Because there is no one to sort of establish and maintain an appropriate status quo of holiness and justice and peace. And the book of Judges is using that as the argument for this is why we need to have a king, to be that person who does that, to be the one who establishes divine justice and then maintains it in the face of sin and injustice within Israel. Right. Because, I mean, God was doing that in the book of Judges, right? But to disastrous consequence. Yeah. Right. Whereas when you have a king, and so there is someone, for example, who is enforcing the Torah. So there is someone who, when you get caught stealing, is now making sure that you pay the restitution right, and repent, rather than things getting so horrible that Israel gets conquered, <laughs> right, there is a maintenance, right, of, of justice within, within the kingdom. And so the king is not sort of doing this independently. It's not that, oh, well, once they get a human king, he does that, and so, so then God doesn't have to, <laughs> right? right. Um, it's, it's that the king is functioning 
as an icon of God as the great king. And his court is sort of functioning as an icon of the divine council. Right? God shares his rule over his creation with first the angelic beings and then later humanity. Um, and the same way the king, obviously, his rule is administered by these people. Right. And this is an icon then of God and his uh, government of the creation. And that sense of icon or image works in both directions. Meaning, on one hand, the king and the mem- other members of his government have a responsibility to image God in what they're doing. So it's God's justice that they're enforcing, not their own whims, not their own preferences, not their own power, not their own authority, right? Yeah. But God's. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, 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 and then the people have a responsibility in turn to treat them like icons of God and his divine counsel. Right. To venerate them. Yeah. <laughs> right. To, to honor them in that way. Even if, and this is why, right, even if the king is a dishonorable cuss, right? And there are plenty of those in the Old Testament, if you've read very much of it, right? In fact, most of them. Um, right. Yeah. And that's, in, in case I forget to come back to it later, that's going to stay true. Most Byzantine emperors and most czars are not saints, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. not often even close. The, yeah, they say often kind of the opposite, actually. <laughs> yes, right? So so this veneration is not, oh, this is a good king. David is a really good king, so him will venerate. But Saul, uh, Jeroboam, uh, right? As the icon of God, right? You, you honor, you give respect to that office because by doing that, you are honoring, giving that honor and respect to God. Yeah. It's it's like my dad used to say when he was in the Navy. He would say, you have to salute what's on the collar, even if there's nothing above it. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. One of my, yeah. that's one of my favorite sayings from when my dad was in the Navy. I'm sure <laughs> it's still probably used. Yeah. So that's, and again, this is this is all, this is all, by the way, again, I don't want to go back into all this topic, but this is all venerate means. Yeah, honor. It's just respect. giving something the respect that's the respect that's due to it, yeah. <laughs> the honor that's due to it based on what it is. Um, so uh, another important point, though, is that the king and his court functioning as an icon in this way, or in both these ways, in both directions, right, is a, again, a deliberate and drastic departure from what's going on in the other nations, or in the nations, where the pagan kings are not icons of the gods, they're idols, in the sense that the king himself is one of the bodies of the god, yeah, right. so he is an embodiment of the God. Offer him worship, not just respect, worship. Like you're offering sacrifices to right. him, he's receiving sacrifices. Right. And so David, right, is an image of God. Uh, Pharaoh is an idol of Horus to whom the people offered worship. Right. You will find lots of people proclaiming praises to David in the Old Testament. That's not idolatry. Yeah. I mean, right. we should remember, like, if you say, and I would never say this, but if you say that Striper is the greatest rock band of all time, you have venerated Striper just by saying that. So just putting that out there, everybody. What if you call a particular striper cover band the greatest striper tribute band of all time? <laughs> I I would be willing to do that. <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah, would I'm you not, not have to listen to all striper tribute bands first? Um, you might. I mean, how many are And there? are you up for that? Is any human up for that? <laughs> there is actually a friend of mine named Ed Bell. So, Ed, if you're listening, 
I know he's probably already done it. So, and is the lead singer of Striper Ted Cruz? That's the big question. And or the Zodiac Killer. Anyway, um, <laughs> yes. But so we see we see this attitude of of veneration very clearly in the story stories the whole narrative where David is on the run from Saul where David will have nothing to do with killing Saul. The whole idea that he is the Lord's anointed. He is the King, right? Therefore he is the image of God's authority. Anything I, anything David did to him, right would be effectively doing that to God. Yeah. And so uh, um, he is not willing to do that. And in fact, this, this goes all the way up to when the Amalekite who saw Saul die uh, goes to David and claims he killed him to claim a reward. David cuts him down where he's standing. Right for for having claimed to kill Saul, even though Saul's trying to kill David, right. made several direct direct attempts on David's life. Right, yeah, you'll um, still have nothing to do with this. This is this is part of where we're getting this. This isn't just me. Hey, he's Orthodox. He's got to try to shove that icon stuff into any, everything. Right? No, this is there in the text. Right? Yeah. This yeah, is this, how this is David my... understands Saul's kingship. Right. Right. And therefore, his own kingship, and how the the scriptures understand kingship, right? Um, and so this, right? Obviously, as we mentioned, you know, we talked about different anointed people, especially kings, uh, when we were talking about the Messiah in that previous episode. And so, technically, right, the anointed king David is the Messiah in that sense; he's the anointed king, right? And so we also understand, the, especially the Davidic kingship, and this was very clearly understood before Jesus of Nazareth was born, right, on this earth. Um, it was very clearly understood that David was the icon, the image of the Messiah who was going to come. Right? We see people in the Gospels, again, especially the synoptic Gospels, who cry out to Jesus and as ex- for healing, and as an expression of their faith, they call him the son of David. Right? Yeah. That's calling him the Messiah. They understood David is sort of this image, this icon of the Messiah who's going to come. And so then there's going to be this natural transition in understanding afterwards. We're not jumping there quite yet. But after the coming of Christ, that kings post the advent of Christ um, are understood as icons of Christ, right? Looking back. But we'll get into that more as we move forward. Um, So a couple more notes sort of on, on Old Testament kingship. One important thing, and we talked about this uh, quite a bit in the Melchizedek episode is that, of course, priest and king are divided right, in the old right. covenant. Yeah, there's uh, no priest kings. Right. And that's as opposed to everywhere else, right, <laughs> where there were priest kings. Um, and that's up to and including the Roman emperor was the Pontifex Maximus, right? He was the great high priest of the Roman empire who had responsibilities to himself offer sacrifices. He didn't just pay for sacrifices, get priests of pagan gods to sacrifices. The Roman emperor was responsible to do sacrifices. We'll come back to that. Um, But um, now we talked about, we've talked before how that division goes back to Moses and the issue with circumcising his son and how sort of the the eldership and the Levitical priesthood was also separated later at the golden calf. Um, and you could see sort of the, the, 
the real power of this division, right? When Saul's sort of final failure is that, remember, he gets impatient with Samuel not showing up in time and decides to go and offer the sacrifices himself. Yeah, which makes him behaving exactly like one of the pagan god kings. Right. Um, not exactly like. Well, okay, sorry. But <laughs> I might be being a little hyperbolic. He, <laughs> yes, he didn't receive sacrifices himself. But, yeah, there we go. Um, yeah. But he did act as a priest king, shall we say, right. uh, illegitimately. Right. And of course, how that's ultimately reunited, right, in Christ um, in a certain way. We'll, we'll talk a little more about that later, too. Um, and of course, with this role, as we already saw a little bit in uh, Deuteronomy 17, with this role, as uh, the king, as the oldest brother, as the uh, icon of the kingship of God, the icon of Christ on earth, uh, also meant that the king is held to a higher standard and to a higher judgment, faces a greater judgment. Uh, this is a basic principle all through the scriptures, including in, in the New Testament. Think about Christ saying, from him who has been given much, much will be required. Everything St. Paul says about not many of you should presume to be teachers, right? Um, and this is especially true, of course, of, of the kings. And what we see when we look at the way the prophets come, both in what are sometimes called genre-wise, the historical books, the former prophets, um, when the prophets come to confront kings there and also within the latter prophets, the prophets proper, when they're talking about the kings and leaders and rulers of, of Israel uh, and even other countries, um, other nations, the, uh, the basis of judgment is basically what is laid out in Psalm 82 or 81 in the Greek which is the basis on which, as we've talked about that psalm before, the gods of the nations are judged. Yeah. Right? The spirits. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like the first verse yeah. of Psalm 82, of course, it says that God stands up in the divine council and, and renders judgment, right? And then it says what the basis of the judgment is. Like this is kind of like reading out the charges against them. And also like this is what you should have done, right? So here's what it is starting with verse 2. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And so the idea, of course, is that these fallen gods, these fallen angels, have not been doing what he told them to do, but instead have been judging unjustly and giving partiality. You know, they've been favoring the wicked. Right. Right. And, and not protecting, right. The people. Yes. And so, right. The, the role that was assigned to these angelic beings at, right. At, uh, Babel at the dividing of the nations was to shepherd them in general. And in particular to shepherd them back to God. Right, and Saint Dionysius the Areopagite talks about this too, as we've mentioned before. And they fail to do it, but this pattern, this is the same thing the prophets condemn the kings for, and so we see that the kingship has this kind of angelic ministry to it, meaning it is also the job of any given king, Israel's king, especially. Right, but also the kings of the other nations to shepherd those people and to shepherd them ultimately back to God. Right. Yeah, so it's a salvific, and, a salvific role. Right. Yeah. And that's why we see this pattern when when it talks about uh, the saints in heaven who experience the first resurrection in Revelation. Or when it talks about the saints in the new heavens and the new earth, this language is used of reigning, ruling and reigning, 
right, of being enthroned with Christ, being part of the divine council that is paralleled with angelic ministry, right? But you also have this ruling, reigning kingship government language, right? And those two things bleed into each other, right? So the, the, the king ultimately, ultimately, to sum this up, what you ultimately get at with the king's responsibility starting with learning and studying the Torah and keeping it fully in, in serving as the image of God on earth to establish justice, right? In performing this function that was otherwise assigned to the angels. Ultimately the command that's given to the King is the osis. Hmm. Right. That's the ultimate command that's that's given to the king and this is part of why christ then is the ultimate king because he is in his person the perfect bringing together of our human nature and god right and and the divine nature are united in his person and so he is the ultimate king, right? By perfectly fulfilling that, right? Um, so yes, the king was particularly, particularly called to that. And this is why um, you see in the language regarding saints in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, again, you know, St. Paul is saying, do you not know that we will judge angels? This connection to uh the the that the um uh, those of church are a royal priesthood right this connection of kingship already kingship within the kingdom right with christ as the king and us as vassals this is also deeply connected to the theosis language right of our of our salvation yeah i mean you know saint athanasius in his on the incarnation which a lot of people like to quote that one line, you know, God became yeah. man so that man might become God or become divinized or whatever. But like the it whole... It is snappy. Kind of, it is a quote. It is snappy, yeah. I mean, don't put <laughs> it on a bumper sticker or whatever, but um, although, you know, maybe put it on a bumper sticker, but... Um, <laughs> Someone has. Yeah. Someone has. <laughs> Someone, yeah. Um, but like the whole, the whole argument that he makes is it's couched within language about adoption, you know, yeah. that, that that's, that's where this comes from. It's not some floating doctrine about, you know, experiencing the Holy Spirit. It's within the context of adoption as sons of God. So. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And if sons, then heirs. Yeah. Indeed. Right. And so, as I mentioned, this isn't just a question of Israel's king. This is every king. Right, every king, the kings of the nations, the corrupt ones, the evilest ones, right, um, all had power and authority given to them by God. He was the source of any power and authority they had, and therefore were responsible. Had this higher level of responsibility. Yeah, I mean, right, Jesus, God. Jesus says that to a pagan ruler, right? He says that to Pontius Pilate. Right? When he's standing in front of him, John chapter 19, verse 11, um, Jesus answered him, that is Pilate, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, that all power is derivative, um, but uh, you know, ultimately, where does all that power come from? It comes from God. God permits even the bad kings to be the king. Yes, and then holds them accountable. Yeah. <laughs> At the end. Right. Um, and um, so this pattern of kingship from the Old Testament and the way it's used and continues into the New Testament, um, we're going to be moving on mostly in the East, as is our want. But when the Western Roman Empire collapses, right, when that collapse happens in Western Europe, and new social structures have to be built. Uh, it's very natural. It was very natural for the Christians there to return to this tradition 
and mm. to bring back anointed kingship as the form of government based on this pattern within within the scriptures, right? How right. should we organize ourselves? Well, you know, spoilers, you're not going to get democracy out of the Old Testament, or, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, or even really the New Testament, well, right? Okay. Um, nor, nor out of medieval Europeans in general. <laughs> No, no, they're not going to come up with this. And, not, and don't, don't, yeah. come at, don't come at me with this Athens stuff. Don't come at me with this Athens stuff. That wasn't real democracy. Yes. Anyway, right. go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, so the one, thing, the one last thing I wanted to say before we go to break about this is, despite what you may have heard, um, you know, as we just said about democracy, there's a certain very popular film that once said, you don't vote for kings. Um, but, Actually, um, in Anglo-Saxon England, you did, although you probably didn't. Uh, well, yeah, it depends on someone you know, did. <laughs> yeah, someone did, but it wasn't. It wasn't the average guy, you know. It wasn't. It wasn't you know the average elf out in the fields. Um, yeah, no, it, it you know it would be the, the 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 nobles, often the lower nobles included. You know the the bishops, the abbots, the dukes, the earls, the thanes. They get to vote for the king. It's not primogeniture in um, Anglo-Saxon England, and the reason why I point that out. So they, they have a big meeting called the Witan Yamut. Um, so the Witan is all the sort of the wise. Easy for you to say. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> and um, but they would have a they would vote right. I mean, it would sometimes be the son of the previous king, but not required. But the reason why I point all that out is because at the ceremony where he becomes king. The king has to swear a bunch of oaths that are considered to bind him to the people and require him to do certain things. And so it's it's a it's a Christian notion of kingship. It's different from the kind of um, you know kingship of just might that is the the pagan style, right? There's this sense of responsibility to the people, um, and of course the fact that he gets elected, there's that sense of responsibility too. Um, again, you know, as they say about feudalism, you know, in, in democracy, theoretically, it's your vote that counts, but in feudalism, it's your count that votes. Um, so that's kind of true in, in Anglo-Saxon England. Um, but but yeah, this idea that the king is responsible. He's not just the biggest guy who can do whatever the heck he wants. So, all right. Well, that said, let's go to our first break and we'll be right back with the second half of The Lord of Spirits. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Ancient Faith Radio is brought to you by our listeners with help from Faith Tree Resources. Are you anxious to grow in your faith, but struggle to carve out time for spiritual disciplines like prayer or reading Holy Scripture? You're not alone. That's why Faith Tree Resources created the Encounter app. This completely free app for your iPhone or Android device is designed to make the daily habit of prayer attainable for everyone, no matter how full your schedule is. The app also includes daily scripture readings that allow you to listen to the passages being read aloud. So whether you've got a long commute to work or have your hands full with kids, the Encounter app makes it easy to get into a daily rhythm of prayer and reflection. Join the thousands of Orthodox Christians around the world who gather daily to pray for the church as the church. Download the free Encounter app today at faithtree.org. That's faithtree.org. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, the Father Andrew Stephen Damick, and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Thanks, Voice of Steve. I actually might be next week seeing the voice of Steve and the whole person of Steve, really. because you know, I was going to say, I don't know him. that you'll see his voice per se. I see a voice. That's actually a line from uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, if I remember correctly. I see a voice. Um, so there you go. That's that was deliberate reference. irony, though. I think. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Wait, there's irony in Shakespeare? <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, welcome back. It's the second half of the show. Again, you can give us a ring at 855-AFRADIO. 
again, that's 855-237-2346. So we spent the first part talking about kingship in the Bible. And uh, now we're going to start talking about kingship as we start to move through history, um, particularly Rome, because, you know, that's one of the big questions, not the only question in Orthodox Church history, but it's certainly one of the big questions about um, how community is organized within uh, within Christian history. So the Roman Empire it is. But let's go to before yes. they were an empire at all, right? And they're just <laughs> yes, these upstarts the beat, beating on the Etruscans. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Yeah, we're we're actually we are going to get to the title of the episode in the second half at least. Yeah, time. that's crazy. Um that's so nuts. yeah. We 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 hear your feedback and okay, gotta be honest, we don't do anything about it, but we do hear it occasionally. <laughs> um I read it. So <laughs> we are we are going to Rome or Rome word, right? Um and so before we could talk about as we just alluded to, uh, St. Constantine. Um, and I know there are people who flinch every time I say that. That's part of why I say it so often. Um, <laughs> we have to talk a little bit about the whole concept of the Roman emperor, right? And and the Roman empire as such, right? Um, so Rome, uh, not built in a day, as it turns out, um, huh. took a long time. Yeah. Um, and so Rome in particular was not a big fan of the idea of kings. Uh, the early kings of Rome in their own understanding of their history uh, were referred to as the tyrants. That's where we get the word, the tyrannus. Mm. Um, and so those were the bad old days, <laughs> right? Of, Six separate of tyrannus. kings. That's yes. what I say. Um, <laughs> we're not controversial. There we go. Um, <laughs> it's the motto of the state in which I was born. Six Semper Tyrannus. Siding with the, the, the assassins. Siding with the assassins. Okay. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. Uh, um, <laughs> we're talking about, say, Constantine the Great. You don't, you don't need any okay, more okay. street cred with that faction. Okay. He's not a tyrant. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> the, um, so Rome then forms a republic centered around the Senate. And the Senate was sort of deliberately constructed in order to have a distribution of power so that power would never sort of overly conglomerate in any one person, right? So you have different roles like the consul, like you have these different roles, but there's always two, three. A lot of times these are chosen by lot. There are different methods in different periods of Roman history by which even when you have to have somebody who's kind of in charge, you make it a couple people and you pit them against each other in various ways, right? To sort of make sure nothing gets out of hand. And this, of course, if you're familiar with American history or you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and looked around, you know that the, the Roman Republic and the functioning of the Roman Senate was sort of the deliberate basis of the American right. system of government. Right. They right. were in the same way, trying to make it unwieldy and make it difficult for any particular person to do anything. Yeah. I mean, when they're, not, when they're <laughs> right. not getting things done, that's, like that's by design. Yes. That's a feature, not a bug, according to right. the framers. <laughs> right. So, but the, the Senate had this too. Right. And so this is why, right, when you get to Julius Caesar, you get to Caesar. At first, you know, the same kind of ploy, he's sort of pitted against Pompey, right, as the other great general. Pompey's out annexing things in the east. Caesar's out dividing Gaul in three parts, right? And we try to, 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 to play them against each other. But ultimately, uh, Caesar is the cannier player and commits the great crime of ambition. Uh, <laughs> that's dun, dun, dun. meaning... He wants to be the guy. Um, and so the Senate doesn't like that. And I really wish we were doing this episode next week on the Ides of March. It would be perfect. But uh, <laughs> he gets stabbed 23 times right on the floor of the Senate. Um, 
et tu brute. <laughs> yeah. Um, and right. Thus always to tyrants. Right. Uh, that's, that's what although, I'm saying. Not, all, not exactly always. Cause it's only one more generation and, and they get one. So, that's um, funny. This kind of then repeats itself in the wake of Caesar's death. You have Mark Antony, who was his heir. You have Octavian, who was his nephew, uh, pitted against each other. Uh, Octavian wins the Battle of Actium. He becomes Caesar Augustus. He succeeds where Julius failed. And now we have a Roman Empire. Uh, the Senate sticks around. There is still a, a Roman Senate, but... Uh, for most of the history of the Roman Empire, they're not doing a whole lot, right? Uh, uh, yeah, they're mostly <laughs> – it eventually devolves into rich people with titles, right? Yeah, it's, um, they're just kind of a nobility of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the title emperor, right? So, But even even with this being the case, even with – Augustus now having basically total power and the people following after him in the Julio Claudian dynasty and then afterwards wielding pretty close to ultimate power later on, much later in the history of the empire, um, as we're going to talk about here in a minute, um, they fall back into old patterns of sort of dividing up authority again, having an emperor in the West and one in the East and an Augustus and right. Trying to, and pitting them against each other on purpose. Right. Um, but even, even when Augustus is fully feeling his oats, even when he's having, uh, uh, Aeschylus like rewrite the history of the empire to focus on him, right. As the <laughs> coming to fruition of all of Roman history, uh, he's not able to take the title King for himself because yeah. Rex yeah. just not happening. Right. That's, yeah. That's, um, that, that's the bad title. We don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's, he's more king than they ever were, but but still, yeah. don't call yourself that. Yeah. So the title becomes Imperator, which is where we get Emperor. Um, yeah, and, and Empire, ultimately, too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which comes from Imperium, right? Um, but the, the Imperator before uh, Caesar is a military title that was awarded as an honorary title after a general had won a great victory in war. Hmm. So Imperator literally means like com commander, the one who commands or the one who orders, the one who puts an order, like musters an army. Right. Um, but because of the context in which it was granted, that was granted after achieving these great victories, it came to have sort of the connotation of conqueror. Right, like the victorious general, right? Um, and so if Imperator is sort of the conqueror, the orderer, then the Imperium is the conquered or ordered area, right? The region that's under his his command, under his orders, right? Under his uh, law giving. And so the Empire grows. There's a number of administrative issues really there was always an eastern and western roman empire right as we just mentioned caesar was in the west and pompey was in the east right there there were there were always there were cultural differences with with uh the way greek was used although greek was used even in the western roman empire for a good while um and uh other cultural differences, but it becomes sort of formal, administratively formal later on. Uh, as we mentioned, you get an emperor, you get an Augustus in each half. You have sort of these four figures who have different powers, again, trying to break things up. Um, but now the aforementioned uh, St. Constantine arrives. Uh, and <laughs> not a saint yet. Um and uh, inherits the title of Augustus in the West uh, while he's in Britain from his father, when his father dies, and decides that he is going to roll things back and he's going to become the emperor emperor. <laughs> right? He's going to become yes. the single 
the single emperor, the monarch, right, of, uh, of the Roman Empire. And so now we're going to talk about St. Constantine. And we're going to be doing now a lot of myth busting. Yay. Because there is this ironic thing where uh, St. Constantine is literally the best documented, documented emperor in Roman history. Yeah, I mean, we know we have more evidence about his life and all the things that he did than any of the rest of them. So anything we you have want to say about yeah. St. Constantine, you kind of you got to look at that evidence. Yes, we have the text of every law he issued as emperor. Amazing. We have the text of nearly, as far as we could tell, nearly every letter, official letter he wrote as emperor. We have all of these multiple biographies from contemporaries who lived at the same time. Um we have all of this documentation about St. Constantine. And yet somehow, somehow, every bizarre wild conspiracy theory on earth <laughs> that you can think of has been attached to St. Constantine somehow by somebody somewhere. Yeah. Right. But um, the vast majority of them are just made up. Yeah. Just yeah. Made up. And so as we go through, as we talk about some of these if we if we have an idea of where this might have come from like sometimes it's like okay well this idea seems to be based on a misunderstanding of x right we'll talk about that but there's a lot of these where there's no x right there's like no, there's just no way on earth to come up with this it's just nonsense just but conspiracy theories but some of this stuff you know we're calling it nonsense we're calling it conspiracy like intelligent people regurgitate this stuff, some of this stuff that has just no basis in history, right? The, the, it's it's amazing to me, right? <laughs> that that um, especially when they're you know go a couple emperors down the road, right? Like Constantius or something, right? Like. Somebody less documented, pin it on him, right? Like, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, of course the first the first thing we need to talk about with Saint Constantine is the vision he has. Yes, this right? is when kind of when he sort of really steps onto the stage of history for most people, right? And this is. Related to his conversion to Christianity, which is what we're going to talk about next, um, and uh, and so this is before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, which ends up being the decisive battle in terms of him defeating his uh, co-emperors, shall we say, just for the sake of ease of argument, right? <laughs> That's uh, his, the other claimants, right, to the imperial throne. Um, and, uh, so he has, now there are, are different accounts of this. So Eusebius of Caesarea, who's the Eusebius who wrote the ecclesiastical history, um, uh, was like the biggest simp for St. Constantine in the history of earth. Um, really it's depressing, right? <laughs> like, it's like pull yourself together, man. When you read some of the stuff he writes about about Saint Constantine, um, and I'm someone who calls him Saint Constantine, and I feel this way reading Eusebius. Um, yeah, <laughs> and so a lot of stuff sounds very embellished, shall we say? Yeah. Uh, we so uh, we also have an account of this dream is it from Lactantius. Lactantius is more reserved about this kind of stuff. Uh, so in terms of my own approach to this stuff, if both Eusebius and Lactantius talk about it, I think it's on secure footing, right. To go with, um, so, and Eusebius records some stuff that's just weird. Like he has, uh, before St. Constantine became a Christian, uh, Eusebius has him in Britain having this vision of Apollo and Apollo predicting he's going to reign for 30 years. And you're like, 
Apollo? Like what? <laughs> right. It seems a little odd. I mean, because you see, is, is, I mean, yes. he's a little bit of a wacky Christian, but he is a Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, What's up with that? Yeah, and and notice, folks. Notice, folks who rely on Eusebius a lot. He's not Saint Eusebius. No, he's a historian. He's an important historian <laughs> from the period. Well, he right. wrote theological stuff too. That's important in various ways. But he was at least a semi Arian, right? He was not, yeah, an Orthodox Christian. Um. So, but you know. Being being a, being a bit heretical does not mean you're wrong about history, right? Doesn't mean you you can't say true things about events that happened in your own time, right? Right. So so he's an important I, witness. I, yeah, yeah. So I look for Eusebius Lactantius crossover when it comes to to say Constantine, and both of them record him. So with Eusebius, there's multiple visions and different things happening, but both of them have him before the Battle of Milvian Bridge. He has this dream. In which Christ appears to him and uh, tells him to put a particular sign on the shields of his men uh, to protect them in battle. And so Eusebius, it's kind of vague as to exactly what this is, right? It's just sort of the sign of the cross. Mm, Yeah. So you're, you're not saying, but Lactantius has, describes it in some more detail as uh, the key row symbol, right? Key, the key and row being the Greek letters, right? The key looking kind of like an X uh, in English. And the capital row looking is the thing that looks kind of like a shepherd's crook, like it's hooked over at the top. Yeah, and they're superimposed like a, over each other. You've like probably seen this symbol. Yeah. You've yeah. probably seen this symbol in the Orthodox Church and or the Roman Catholic Church still uses it. Um, not with the keys and everything. Um, sorry, right. Vatican. Um, but uh, but just the, the symbol of the key in the row, which, of course, are the first two letters in Christos and which right. also forms a cross shape. Yeah. Um, and so this... Uh, St. Constantine did this. St. Constantine won the battle. St. Constantine became emperor. Uh, after the battle, uh, because of this, he issued the Edict of Milan, the Edict of Toleration, that uh, legalized Christianity, but all other religions too, <laughs> right, to be fair. Uh, granted, broad legal toleration, but... It wasn't just like, okay, we're not going to persecute you anymore because within the Roman Empire, persecution was always sort of localized at different times and different periods, right? It wasn't just perpetually we're killing all the Christians we find for 300 years, right? Yeah, um, no, it's, it was kind of sporadic <laughs> and local. Sporadic, and, yeah. right? So it wasn't just, hey, we're not going to do that anymore. It was also, right, property that had been seized from Christianity – for being an illicit religion was returned, right? There was restitution made from the Roman imperial government to Christian clergy, Christian institutions, right? Christian people. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, this, this is the not edict. the, this is not the point of course, at which Christianity becomes like the established official religion of the Roman empire. That doesn't happen for another no. 50 something years under uh, Theodosius. Close to 70. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. two generations <laughs> pass before that yeah. happens. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So actually, so before we move on to the next point, we have someone who's calling in. Um, so we've got Robbie on the line. So Robbie, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? We hear you, Robbie. Welcome to the Lord of Spirits podcast. I'm glad you awesome. called because someone recently asked, you know, whether, whether it was no longer a live show with actual callers. And I said, I said, well, I guess it's done then. So you've saved the show. Welcome back. Yes. Welcome. Yeah, I think there's just so many uh, episodes to work through now that uh, <laughs> you know, no one's People are still up. trying to get caught up. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, Robbie, so welcome. And uh, what, is, what is your question for us this evening? Yeah, thank you. So first of all, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, thank you for everything that you guys do. Um, but yeah, my question is, 
about um, kind of this idea of coronation uh, as a sacrament. I know you guys are going to talk a lot more about this, so maybe I'm jumping the gun. But I, I specifically wanted to ask, there seems to be this conflict. I don't know if it's a conflict or a development, a change or something, where early on it looks like the patriarch is crowning the emperor and or later like the king, you know, and like the king of Yugoslavia or something. But then later it seems as though like the, the czar and I don't know, maybe some emperors you would know better um, kind of purposefully crown themselves uh, seemingly as a symbol of their authority comes directly from God and not through the church. At least that's what I've read from people who talk about this. Um, so I don't know I, that that's kind of one of the parts that, kind of doesn't sit well with me. It seems like if it's a sacrament, it should be like a sacrament that comes from the church and everything and why the flip-flop. So I don't know if you guys know anything about that, but that's always been a great curiosity to me ever since I started looking into this stuff. Yeah. Well, so uh, so at, actually at the end of this half, we're going to take people on a little walk through a particular coronation ceremony for an emperor. So hang on to that. That'll be fun. Um, and it's one of the later Byzantine emperors, but, but I am, a uh, I, I, I can't name any names off the top of my head. So maybe, you know, father Stephen, but I, I, I have remember reading about some European Kings that do crown themselves. You know, there's a sense of, you know, that there's this, this sense that, as you said, you know, well, that's mine. I'm the person with the power here anyway. Um, so, you know, give me, um, but, but I would say though, that in general, the standard is that you know, the, the king is crowned by whoever the chief bishop in his realm is. That's what typically occurs. Um, certainly, I'm sure that's what we're going to see, you know, not too long with King Charles III, is that the Archbishop of Canterbury is going to put the crown on his head. You know, that it's not something he does for himself. I don't know, Father Stephen, do you know um, of any Christian kings that are crowning themselves? Yeah, well, so... Um... There's, of course, the, I mean, famously, there's the Charlemagne argument about whether he crowned himself or not. Yeah, um, I knew that was a little fuzzy. But, yeah. but, um, but also, so in, in terms of of Robbie's direct question, a lot of people now, I mean, this was everybody learned about this 20 years ago when I was coming into the church, but apparently nobody does now, um, or at least I have reason to believe that a lot of people haven't um, about what happened from the 16th century on with the Russian church uh, that, right. I mean, Peter the great gets rid of the patriarch. Yeah. There's no patriarch. There's just the Holy Synod. Right. And he does that deliberately to pattern the government of the Russian Orthodox church after the government of the Lutheran churches in Germany. Uh, and then right. in later periods, they bring in Jesuits to teach at all the seminaries. Right. So there's this period of time where, uh, the Russian church gets subjected to the Russian state. Uh, those czars are not uh, super pious people in the sense of orthodox piety, at least, right? Um, and so a lot of the traditional practices of the orthodox church get subjugated to the whim of the emperor or empress, if we're talking about Catherine, right? Um and so lots of things happen <laughs> like that um, because the church did not have the power. Right? Well, you, obviously you can't have the czar getting crowned by the patriarch if there isn't one. Um, and uh, so lots of things like that happen. Lots of things, even by people who are saints, they're, they're saints because of how they live their lives. Right. Uh, but you, you have texts coming out of Russian seminaries and Russian church officials at that time where you find Lutheranism or Roman Catholic Jesuit theology or at least terminology all over the place. Right. And it's not that they were heretics. It's not that they weren't really Orthodox. They were. It's just the time they grew up in the education they received, that's the terminology they learned. And so in their lives, they're clearly practicing the Orthodox faith in a true way, 
right? Or at least the, the truest way they could, given the material realities of the time and place that they lived. Uh, and that's why they're saints. But um, a lot of the outer forms in that get subjugated to the whims of some very not holy people in the in the Russian civil government, which really, uh, the, the further you go into the modern age, is is deliberately trying to compete with and pattern itself after the modern governments of Western Europe. They have sort of an inferiority complex. Um, and so, yeah, a lot, a lot of things like that, unfortunately, unfortunately happen. I mean, we're, we're in part eight of our sacrament series, but if you go to a lot of the theological manuals that are published during that period when the Jesuits are teaching in all the Russian seminaries, they'll say there's seven sacraments and they give the Roman Catholic list. Yeah. Right. Whereas if you look at older stuff or, or Orthodox stuff that's coming from places not affected by the Russian crown and what it's doing, you'll see longer lists. You'll see lists of 10 lists of 12. Um, but so, yeah, I would chalk up those incidents with the czar to that same kind of um, foreign spirit from Europe uh, making intrusions into the, the civil government of Russia. And that isn't to me any kind of argument against the Orthodox faith because, I mean, there are iconoclast emperors within the Byzantine Empire. Uh, at least where the emperors was a monothelite, there's emperors with all kinds of different sympathies all through, you know, and the iconoclast emperors were killing people and torturing people for having icons, you know. Um, so there's no guarantee that any given emperor will be a saint, uh, that he will respect the church and subject himself to the church any more than there was any guarantee that the king of Israel would actually read the Torah and try to practice the commandments. <laughs> right. right? Um, so yeah, the, yeah, you're right that those things happen. Um, and I think that spirit, that modern spirit from Western Europe that infected the government of Russia for centuries is uh, responsible for it. There you go. That's my take, that, at least. Does that uh, does that help, Robbie? Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you, fathers. I love the show. And uh, yeah, uh, my wife and I are actually in the process of, uh, and my son, of joining the Orthodox Church um, right now. So awesome. a lot of that is because of you guys. So thank you. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. All right. Well, thank you for calling. Okay. So the question now that I know is on everybody's mind is, did Constantine really convert to Christianity? Yes. There you go. Good night. Okay. Um, it's been a while since I did one of those. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, this is this is uh, one of those things. So, <laughs> the, part of the problem, part of the problem is the kind of ludicrous level of presentism uh, that's presupposed when this topic is even addressed by contemporary people, including scholars. So, the question as it is commonly asked in the present day, did Constantine convert to Christianity? Is understanding conversion to Christianity as a combination of some kind of emotional experience or feeling with him changing his ideas or beliefs about certain things? Right. So... Bunch of problems there. First of all, as people who listen to this show know, that's not what conversion is. Um, yeah, you're not and, judged by, you know, Christ is not going to come in the end <laughs> to judge how everyone feels in their heart. Yeah, or what everyone thinks in their head. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, it's a bigger problem for anybody who's trying to work as a historian because how on earth can you determine? the feelings in someone's heart and the ideas in their head. Right. <laughs> like, 
good luck with that, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, um, no point, there's no point in the canonical tradition regarding conversion or the baptismal service where anyone says, you know, how do you feel? Or, like, are you sincere? I mean, there is a line, of course, I believe in him as king and God, but that's really, like, I'm faithful to him as king and God. Like, this is what I'm going to do, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And so the main, all of the main arguments that are made by people, not all, most, we'll get to the other one in a little bit. The main arguments that are made for why, when, when someone is going to say he didn't really become Christian, are all examples of where he tolerated Roman paganism. Mm, yeah. Right. So he lets, he doesn't burn down all the pagan temples. Uh, he doesn't, uh, you know, uh, require all the senators to convert to Christianity. Uh, he doesn't um, uh, immediately say, no more coins with pagan symbols on them. We're going to print Jesus on all the coins now or something. Um, right. So, so he, he doesn't do those things. Right. And therefore he didn't really become a Christian. The presupposition there, of course, is that Christianity is completely intolerant. Right. <laughs> right. The presupposition there is that if he was really a Christian, he would have immediately gone on a witch hunt. Yeah. Uh, right? outlawed, which outlawed a lot of them. Yeah. Kill them all. Yeah. Which falls the category of what? Yeah. <laughs> right. Because there aren't a bunch of Christians around in the third century, even at the depths, the bitterest depths of persecution who are writing things talking about how, Oh, we need to get revenge. One of these days we're going to get power and we're going to go and kill all these pagans the way they killed us and torture them the way they tortured us. There aren't any Christians writing those things because that's not how Christianity works. Hmm. Right. We have a rich theology of martyrdom that was taken over from the Jewish concept of martyrdom in the second temple period. Okay. We, we're not looking for, we're not, we're, we're never looking for revenge. So why would you expect Constantine to do that if he became a Christian, right? That's just a prejudice that a given person has against Christianity and a caricature of Christians that they have. And since Constantine doesn't turn into that after his conversion, oh, he must not have really converted. <laughs> Which, Kill them all, you know, or else you don't love Jesus. <laughs> yes, colossally stupid argument, right? Yeah, colossally yeah. stupid argument, uh, or set of arguments, right? Um, but so, if we look at the only thing we have access to, what Saint Constantine did after his conversion, and as we already mentioned, we have unparalleled access to all the things he did, <laughs> right? Um, it paints a very different picture of change right off the bat, right off the bat. Uh, St. Constantine establishes himself as the sole emperor of Rome. He is now imperator. He makes, he assembles a Roman triumph, right? Which was a large military procession, like a large, a huge military parade yeah, it's a into big, the city victory, of Rome. Victory parade that you do after you win. Right. And so he organizes this, marches into Rome, and all the ones in the past, right, the emperor marches into Rome, proceeds to the Temple of Jupiter on Palatine Hill, and there, as the Pontifex Maximus, offers sacrifices to Jupiter in thanks for his victory and his enthronement. St. Constantine marches into the city and goes directly to his palace right? Does not pass Jupiter temple, does not collect 200 dead goats or whatever. My analogy is breaking down. Um, he goes directly to his residence, did not offer the pagan sacrifices. Now our folks who want to say, I mean, that in itself is, is, is a huge piece of evidence that the conversion was real, right? The fact that he breaks with centuries of tradition, by not giving thanks to Jupiter for his victory and instead giving credit to Christ. That alone 
right, is monumental for, yeah. as a break. Right. So our no, he didn't really convert people, right? Their response is, uh, well, technically his victory was in a civil war. Not over foreign enemies. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to make that claim, then you have to show that no Roman emperor ever did that kind of thing when yeah. being victorious in the Civil War. And you know what? They did. Yeah. Augustus sure celebrated. Right. <laughs> right, he, right. Um, and this wasn't just a one-off for St. Constantine. It isn't just, oh, that one time he didn't offer pagan sacrifices, Right. He himself never offered any more pagan sacrifices, mm. despite having been a priest. And he never tried to offer the Eucharist himself. Mm. Meaning he abandoned the priesthood, which the he, pagan priesthood. Which he had by right of being the emperor. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that included he ended pagan sacrifices before his armies went into battle and instituted having Christian priests come and offer the Eucharist. Yeah, that's a big deal. He, he issued a law that Christian clergy within the empire were exempt from public service. There were a couple different types of public service in the Roman Empire. There was, of course, military service. But there was also just sort of public work service where you get kind of drafted to do work in the community, right? Labor. Um, that you're eligible for. Uh, Christian clergy were exempted from that so that they could serve the liturgy and commemorate St. Constantine at the liturgy in prayer because this is where the word liturgy comes from. It means public works. Yeah. Right? So the Christian liturgy, Christian prayers, Christian worship was reclassified by St. Constantine as public service offered to the empire. So they were immune from all other public service. When he built Constantinople, okay, St. Constantine built Constantinople and made the pagans pay for it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> right. He, the Christians were exempt from the tax. He made uh, pagans pay the tax and this cause, this was a sort of passive aggressive way to close down pagan temples because he took as tax money, the money that would have gone to those pagan temple endowments. And so a lot of the pagan temples ended up closing because they couldn't afford to keep functioning because their money was going to build Constantinople, which was the first city built in the history of the world with no pagan temples in it. Hmm. And yes, that includes cities in ancient Israel, as we unfortunately know from the Old Testament. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> That's, um, no pagan temples within the city of, of uh, Constantinople ever. Hmm. Um, in uh, 325, he shut down uh, gladiatorial combat. Which... You know, that thing that he did in life will echo into eternity. Yes. And you and you are not entertained. That's right. Um, they're making a sequel to that movie. Did you know that? I did not know that. Russell Crowe is not in it oh. for obvious reasons. Spoilers. So um, Les Miserables was not the sequel to... Anyway. No. No, that doesn't work, man. Back to the drawing board with that film theory. <laughs> um, so uh, St. Constantine also outlawed crucifixion as a form of capital punishment yeah uh, he did not outlaw capital punishment right uh, like <laughs> that's hanging gotta be honest and, here right and, and I'm sure some and sure right. the, the, hanging some people were getting their heads cut off by swords too probably yeah but it was mostly hanging instead of crucifixion but he got rid of crucifixion because he said it was disrespectful to Christ for them to crucify people. Um, one of the most interesting laws he issued was he issued a law that slaves and convicted criminals could not be branded except on their feet. 
right? So one of the punishments of the Roman Empire for being convicted of certain crimes, right, or when you were a slave to mark you out as a slave was you would be branded and they would generally brand you in a very conspicuous place because the idea was you don't want this slave to be able to cover it up and escape. Yeah. You don't want uh, – you know, criminals to be able to disguise the fact that they were convicted of this crime. You want them to be permanently marked. So they generally be branded in the face. Yeah. Uh, Cause that was really hard to cover up. And in that law, St. Constantine explicitly says that the reason uh, criminals and slaves can no longer be branded on the face is that branding, the branding of the face, the disfigurement of the face disrespected the image of Christ in which That's the person amazing. was created. It's amazing. It's not just like this is cruel or whatever, but like it's actually a theological reason. Yes. Yeah. That that person is in the, even the slave, even the convicted criminal is created in the image of Christ and therefore you cannot disfigure him in this way. Um, so, of course, right, there's a collective case there for how he's ruling and how he's thinking after his conversion that I think is entirely compelling. Hmm. Right. I'm not saying he had all of his theology worked out correctly. I'm not saying, right. (laughs) Right. But in terms of, right, this, this pagan who's now become the most powerful man on earth, right. Claims to have become a Christian. Let's look at how he governed. There's th- this is I think conclusive evidence that he was at least trying to be a Christian. Yeah, <laughs> right? he was at least trying to figure out what that meant. No one was that make, like, no right? one was making him do this stuff, and yes. it was probably in his in terms of just you know shoring up his power and stuff. It was not in his best interests, you know, to change these kinds of policies right. that had always always kind of sort of worked for Roman empires emperors, you know, to aggregate. There was not there, and. They're not like a bunch of powerful, wealthy Christians who are going to repay him for doing this. No. Right? Because <laughs> right. before the edict, before the edict under uh, uh, Diocletian, right, the Roman government seized all the Christian property, right? <laughs> Christians had nothing. They were being tortured. They were being mutilated, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that whole dog don't hunt. So probably, though, the most famous Christian thing that St. Constantine did was convene the Council of Nicaea. Yes. And here come the conspiracy theories again. Yeah, there's so many of these. I feel like we should just do like, you know, uh, uh, lightning round, naming them off. Yeah. (laughs) All the things that the Council of Nicaea. Well, some of them require a little more explanation. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. This is, this is like what a, I don't even know how many I've listed here. Is this like a top 10, top eight, something like that? Uh, Because we could go on forever listing if we tried to list every weird Council of Nicaea conspiracy theory. Okay, so so I'm going to just throw them out. And and, and if you have something you have to say about a particular one, then just say it. Okay, all right. Okay, so the Council of Nicaea did not, I feel like there should be a little bell or something, ding, did not decide what's in the Bible. That I have something to say about. Okay, all right. Yeah. So... So this is common, right? All kinds of very intelligent people say this, right? Uh, And it's just entirely an urban legend that there was some kind of canon, either of the Old or New Testament or something that was decided at Nicaea, that they decided some books were in and some were out. It did not happen. It was not even discussed at the Council of Nicaea. Now, this is one of the ones where, where... like I have a theory maybe about how the misunderstanding that started the urban legend. Right. Um, But the more I investigated it, the more I found that that's not at all what happened. So you will find uh, testimony that after the council of Nicaea, St. Constantine requested 50 copies be made of the Christian scriptures. Hmm. Right. So my thought is someone reading that sort of tried to connect the dots and said, well, wait a minute. Like those copies must have had a table of contents and therefore de facto, right? That's a canon list. 
So, right, like maybe that's where it came from. But as I investigate more, I discovered upon further research that he actually commissioned 50 gospel books. So, yeah, there's just liturgical gospels. that The four just, with the four gospels. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah. So yes. Yes. A piece so of the canon. you can't get a canon list from the four gospels. Right. Yep. Uh, and the four gospels had been established as the four gospels at least since the middle of the second century. St. Irenaeus talks about yeah, it. So this is right? at least so 200 years. Yeah. Yes. He didn't yeah. decide which gospels were gospels. Right. Okay. okay. So back right, to the so, list. The Council of okay. Nicaea did not. Also did not <laughs> ding create the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Did not ding cover up Jesus's secret family. So at least Mary Magdalene. Yes. Conspiracies. Yeah. Did not uh, change the identity of Jewish people. What's yes. that about? Actually, yes. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> uh, well, there's variations of this. There's okay. uh, there's I- English people were the real Jewish people. There's. Oh, uh, <laughs> OK. There's black people were the real Jewish people. Uh, there's a whole series of those where okay. St. Constantine declared the people who we now know as Jews to be Jews and some other group that actually were the original Israelites to not be anymore. Wow. Which didn't happen. All right. All right. All right. So British Israelism, et cetera. All right. The Council of Nicaea (laughs) did not, did not ding burn any books, any churches or people. (laughs) Yes. Yes. There was a functioning Aryan church in Constantinople. For another century after the Council of Nicaea. How about that? For a hundred years, Nestorius closed it. (laughs) Uh, Until when he was (laughs) the Archbishop of Constantinople. Yes. So (laughs) great. Not there was what? Right there in the Imperial City. Arians, right? Arians were not getting killed, they were not getting burnt. St. Constantine spent the rest of his life trying, uh, well, the rest of Arius' life, actually, uh, trying to get Arius to be reconciled to the church, writing Mm -hmm. letters to Arius, writing letters to bishops, trying to heal this thing. So not only did he not go and start killing all the Arians, right? Like, he was trying to see if we couldn't figure this thing out, right? Yeah. So so he didn't have to burn any books because they didn't decide on the canon. Yeah, right, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so <laughs> relatedly, the Council of Nicaea did not force Constantine's theology on anyone because yes. he might have been kind of a semiarian. Yeah, all indicators are that the decision of the Council of Nicaea regarding the deity of Christ uh is not actually was not Constantine's personal opinion at the time of the council. There you go. All right, the Council of Nicaea did not, and this should be really obvious, everybody, but anyway, did not (laughs) proclaim Jesus to be divine rather than merely human. Well, it's not obvious to Dan Brown. I know. I know. That's the thing is people (laughs) say this. They're like, oh, the Council of Nicaea invented the idea that Jesus is God. I'm like, excuse me. Jesus is God, right. Excuse me. (laughs) The Arians thought Jesus was God. Yeah. People need to get through that. The Arians. They thought, yes, exactly. They right. just thought he was a god rather than the god. Yeah, right? I mean the big, the like, big debate, the big debate in the first couple of centuries, especially, was not so much how or is he god, but rather is he human? You know, right? Like, like, well, so and he, and you know, in what docetist. sense is he divine? Yeah, right. 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 In what right. sense is he divine? Yeah. 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 Okay. The Council of Nicaea did not ding move Christian worship to Sundays. I mean, read. Justin Sorry, Martin, Ellen people. G. White. Yeah. Sorry, Ellen G. White. I think that's two episodes in a row where we've got no. It was, it no. was Mary Baker Eddy last. Oh, time. that's right. Okay. And the fact that you can't tell white woman heresiarchs apart is some kind of racism, Father. <laughs> and I have to call you on it publicly. <laughs> Maybe I should read my own book. Uh, yeah, where, that would help. Where I list, you know, I wrote it down in my diary so I wouldn't have to remember. <laughs> so, <laughs> there um, yeah, okay. so that didn't happen. The Lord's Day. It's in the pages of the New Testament that, the, the, that Christians were gathering on the Lord's Day. Yeah, yeah. That's the first day of the week. Right. Sunday. Right. Now, now. That's it. This one, though, 
I have is one where I have a theory again. So there's right? actually a possible basis for this. A possible basis of complete misunderstanding. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And that's that say Constantine did issue a law making uh, Sunday, the first day of the week, the Lord's Day. We'll just say the Lord's Day. Right. Um, Kiriaki, right. Um, a An official day of rest. Meaning. Okay. Yeah. What that functionally meant, right? If you were a farmer, you didn't get any days of rest, right? <laughs> but Which was most people. But in cities, government offices, for example, the bureaucratic offices of state, right? The government offices, government functions were shut down on the Lord's Day, right? Because everyone, including the government officials, including the emperor, were at, in the liturgy, right? Um Except, this is another one of those interesting little tidbits when you read the law. There was one government office that stayed open on the Lord's Day. And that was the office of manumission. If you wanted to free a slave, you could go free a slave on the Lord's Day. That's the one civil government function you were allowed to do. That's pretty And uh, once again testimony to you know this is the only testimony we have to the thoughts and feelings of saint constantine right but that he understands something going on there with the lord's day and the resurrection and uh what's that about nice um okay the council of nicaea did not begin the practice of baptizing babies yes yes right did not. Sorry, certain groups of Baptists. That's not all Baptists. <laughs> it's true. There are a lot of Baptists who are good, reasonable people who have some understanding of church history. I mean, there's most a few the folks out there, though. <laughs> most of the Baptists yeah. that I was raised with have never even, I mean, and it's not their fault, but they've never even heard of the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. It's not their fault. No one ever told them about yes. this. Yeah. Um, and finally, the Council of Nicaea did not have the option to change the mode of production in the empire, which seems like a kind of abstruse thing for us to, de to uh, yes. you know, deny. But, but people have said this, like, you know, they had a chance to get together and vote, like, to end slavery. They could have done that. Yes. People have said this recently. Very well-educated, very smart people in public. Who who know a lot who, about Who, if I history. name names on this show, yes. Who, if I name names on this show, I would name, but I don't do that. Yes. Um, Especially when I'm about to say something is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so, yes, yes, a very wise, smart, intelligent person, and then a bunch of other, at least reasonably intelligent people, like retweeted this and praised this as like the most brilliant thing ever said about Everyone's how. Everyone's looking this the up council, on the Twitters now. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. I'm calling this. I'm saying this person said one of the most colossally stupid things I've ever heard, and. You can tell him that, and I'll explain it to him in person. Um, that that this was a horrible missed opportunity because they could have, they could have, you know, ended slavery. They could have ended poverty in the Roman Empire, right? Like they could have just voted to do that, right? Like let's just completely change the economic system under which the entire Roman Empire functions by three hundred bishops voting on it. Yeah, right? <laughs> bishops voting. So, Right. Yes. Yes. Like <laughs> about something that the council was not convened to decide, right? Even yeah. remotely. And, and, and has but no jurisdiction over. Right. Yeah. The, but there's multiple there's multiple levels to, to how dumb this is. So <laughs> the first the first level of how dumb it is Settling is <laughs> like we just said. That that would have worked if they tried it, right? Like that, that was actually yeah. a possibility. I mean, right? we should. By the way, we should not say that we're like pro slavery or anything. It's just like no, this was not a possibility at this. That was council. not something they could do. Now there were people at this time, for example, like Saint Gregory of of this. Well, a little after this time, but Saint Gregory of Nyssa, on uh, two subsequent Pascas in his sermon told his people they had to free all their slaves because it was morally wrong for them to claim to own another person created in the image of Christ. We just talked about how the manumission office was the one office open on the Lord's Day, right? So yeah, clearly 
Christianity was going to end slavery. But you can't do that in like a day yeah. by a bunch of bishops voting, right? Because an empire is a complex economy right? <laughs> with right. sources of labor and value generation. And these kind of you can't just like flip a switch, like, okay, yeah. now we're gonna be capitalists. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, and 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 you know, let, let's, <laughs> let's face it. When was the last time that an you know, like an agreed statement voted on by bishops became immediately effective to everyone who possibly read it? Like, oh yes, yes. Like that's yes. not that's. I wish you know, like I wish, but, yeah, but no. So, but but there's a deeper level of dumb. There's a deeper level of dumb, <laughs> right? and okay. that deeper level of dumb is not understanding that there are material preconditions for ideas to emerge. Mm. Right? So part of the reason they could decide to become a capitalist democracy in 325 at the Council of Nicaea is that they had no idea what capitalism or democracy were. Right. These ideas did not exist yet, right? You can't have capitalism, really, until you have the idea of enclosure and until you have the idea of commodity production at the beginning of industrialization, which didn't exist yet, right? Like the ideas on which those later ideas were built did not exist yet, right? So, yes, people like St. Gregory of Nyssa could look at the institution of slavery and say, this is wrong, and say to individual people, you need to not participate in this, right? But if St. Constantine, let's say they'd taken a vote to end slavery and St. Constantine said, you're right, I hereby issue this law, slavery is over, everyone is free. What happens the day after? Right. Who's farming food? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Who, just doesn't right. Like <laughs> this, this requires massive restructuring. So, not only could they not have done it, right, but they could not have even conceived of doing it in three twenty five AD. Yeah. So, the idea that somehow was a missed opportunity that they are somehow blameworthy, the fathers of the Council of Nicaea are somehow blameworthy. Because they're being too narrow-minded and just focusing on this theological stuff and not, not you know, our, our important, you know, bourgeois liberal values, right, is ridiculous and absurd. And one of the stupidest things that's ever been said publicly. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, they couldn't have done that. <laughs> okay. This would so have been – this, <laughs> this argument is like saying that Vatican I in the middle of the 19th century should have voted to abolish the euro. Which right. didn't exist yet. Right. That's <laughs> right. Anyway. Yeah. Rant rant over. I think okay. this is the first time I've gone on a full on rant like that on the show. But yeah, uh, this show. people who live with me hear them all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on this show. I've heard you rant on Whole Council of God a couple of times. So. Okay, fair. Yeah, yeah. Fair. Um Okay, so there's some things that the Council of Nicaea did do. Um, yes, now the positive. Let's focus on the positive. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to get into super detail here, but I think it's just important to kind of debunk a bunch of that stuff. Okay, so yes, the Council of Nicaea did, you know, make a ruling against Arianism, though not strictly because there were still some semi-Arians kind of around. Um, the Council of Nicaea did establish how you're supposed to date Pascha. Uh, the Council of Nicaea did codify the findings of a bunch of preceding local councils. Let's see if you actually read the canons, they'll say, and, and this council, and this council. And yes. the Council of Nicaea did establish the very important precedent of actually holding ecumenical councils. So that's yes. why we call it the first ecumenical council. Right. And they, of course, tied that back to Acts 15 in the Council of Jerusalem, but... Oh, yeah. This is a yep. different conception, right? The idea didn't come out of nothing because, as we just said, ideas don't come out of nothing. Uh, but, yeah. but, but yeah, they, they use but, that same language. It seemed good to the Holy yeah. Spirit and to us. And that's, that, right. then get, that, become, that formula gets picked up then uh, you know, by the other ecumenical councils. Right, right. And so they're, they're building on something, but 
this then establishes the pattern that's going to be used going forward. Yeah. 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 Right. And, you know, a, a, a part of that pattern that a lot of people aren't happy with and that probably is responsible for a lot of those urban legends at all that we've been uh, talking about is the fact that the emperor, in this case, St. Constantine, presided at the council. Yeah. Called it and then <laughs> right presided. Right. And so, again, this is a prejudice that's wormed its way deep into our brain of the idea of separation of church and state. Right. Yeah. If you're an American, if you're not an American, uh, you may not have separation of church and state per se, but the modern world, the modern West, at least definitely has an idea of a sacred sphere and a secular sphere. So there's the church and then there's the secular, right? So there's the church authority and the secular authority, right? And so if you have that paradigm in your head, then, hey, the emperor, he's this secular authority and he's coming in here to meddle in the church's business, <laughs> right? Which he shouldn't be involved in because he's the secular authority. Right. right? Um, but, of course, 325, we don't have any of those concepts yet, again. Um, yeah, I mean, we've but literally, also, yeah. literally just stopped having an emperor <laughs> who was the chief priest. Yes. <laughs> That's... <laughs> He's the first one to do it this way, even to separate yeah, it right. this much. Right. Right. Um, so, um, so, so this idea has not, has not developed yet, but if we look at why St. Constantine says he called the council, he called the council because he wanted to preserve the peace of the empire, the peace and unity of the empire. Right. Uh, not because he was dabbling in theology, not because he wanted to weigh in on one side or the other, not because he wanted an imperial church that would do his bidding, right? It was because there was this theological issue that it seems like he didn't entirely understand at the time that was deeply troubling the empire, causing civil discord, uh, strife, lack of unity and his job as the emperor remember justice everything in the right place everything functioning properly everything good he's concerned about this and so when you look at the canons of the council you see the canons are aimed at the communal life of the church and thereby the communal life of the empire yeah right and so th this this falls under his concern right that said it is the bishops who decide the issues. He calls the bishop together to decide these issues to preserve the peace and unity of the empire. Right. As we mentioned a couple times now, St. Constantine's theology, his own personal theology, you know, seems like he was probably a, some kind of semi-Arian, right? Not a seminarian. <laughs> uh, not all seminarians are semi-Arians. But some are. Um, some are, yeah. Uh, that's, uh, so um, it's hard to totally tell. A lot of the case, a lot of times, you'll see people very confidently saying that he was a semi-Aryan. But the people, the, the, the main reason they're saying that so confidently is that they're thinking of like Eusebius of Nicomedia and Eusebius of Caesarea, who are semi-Aryans, who were in his inner circle. Yeah, and wasn't it wasn't it Nicomedia who baptized him? Is, is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Nicomedia was sort of the, the the bishop of Nicomedia was sort of the imperial chaplain for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's so there's an element of guilt by association there. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't right, but I'm saying we don't know. Yeah. Right. We we don't have again. We don't have access to his inner thoughts and feelings. Um. But you know, he probably was somewhere in that range because these are the guys he's hanging around with. And right as as I mentioned before, he's trying to find some way to mediate this dispute. Right. He's not just falling on the Nicene side and saying, "Arius, you're no good. You're a heretic." He's still trying to reconcile things for the rest of Arius's life. Um. 
Now we do have the closest thing we do have to a sort of direct window into his theological thinking is he actually delivered what is commonly titled the oration to the assembly of the saints. Okay. And uh, you can look that up uh, online. There's five or six different public domain translations of it. It's all over the place. Um, There's lots of really interesting things there that again are very confirmatory toward the idea that, that this guy is at least trying to figure out how to be a Christian. (laughs) <laughs> right, and be the emperor. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's not long enough and detailed enough. It's not like him presenting a systematic theology either, where you could figure out what he believed on all these different issues. Uh, but the key elements, he's, he's speaking from a very Roman perspective in the sense that he's t- he sees Christ as sort of the one who has delivered the Roman world, the Gentile Roman world, from idolatry. Hmm. So there's a lot of uh, uh, distinction made there, idolatry as an evil, the pagan worship as an evil, over against Christ as the Logos, right? Bringing true knowledge of God, Right over against idolatry, but he gets into some nuance. He has kind of a nuanced critique of Plato in there. He has um, he talks about a number of different things, and he ends up sort of the the last part of it is he's taking these ancient Roman pagan texts that he says are from the Sibylline books. It's hard to tell if that's true um, because the Sibylline books were kept secret and stuff. So I'm sure he thought they were from the Sibylline books, but whether they actually were or not is tricky um we've talked about those before on the show uh but which he interprets as being prophecies of christ that were given to the roman civilization to prepare them for the coming of the gospel yeah um so that's also it's it's sort of a fascinating document and like i said it's not a systematic theology you're not going to figure out whether he's a heretic or not from it um in this case, but again, it gives further evidence that this guy's at least th- trying to think and function as a, as a Christian. And what does now, now that Christ had quite literally kind of appeared in his life, right? How, how do I need to reorient things? So I mentioned that aside from the, hey, he didn't kill all the pagans, so he must not have been a Christian. The other big argument is, and this is actually, this has a little more teeth to it is uh, the fact that after his conversion, he was manipulated politically into murdering his wife and his son, Uh, which is bad. That's bad. Yes. Those are horrible sins, right? And horrible crimes. Um, So we have to remember, though, that saints are saints based on how they end up not based on having been like perfect their whole life. Yeah. So, you know, St. Paul tells us he's responsible for a bunch of murders. Uh, David was responsible for a murder. <laughs> right? um, people are responsible for murders. That's not to say, Oh, don't worry about it. Right. But that is a grievous sin. So then what you have to look for in his life are signs of repentance. Hmm. Right. Um, if we're going to talk about him as a saint. And so um, that brings us to his baptism. Yes. And it, it legendarily uh, goes, you know, on his deathbed, right? So like he's yeah, so little of a Christian, he waited until almost he was dead. Yes. Yeah. That's the, that's the, one of the raps he gets. Um, so, um, that's not entirely true. So people will also, they'll generalize, generalize past, um, um, they just say Constantine himself and say, Oh, well, everybody, right. Everybody got, uh, baptized on their deathbed. Cause they thought there was no forgiveness of sins after baptism. And yeah. A lot of that is semi-imaginary. Um, 
I'm not saying no one did that, right? But with St. Constantine in particular, we know he wasn't doing that. Uh, because St. Constantine, near the end of his life, was preparing uh, to begin an Eastern military campaign, uh, meaning he was going after the Persians. Uh, and this is a whole subtopic that uh, this episode's going to be a long one, but it don't have to be this long. Get into relations between him and the Persian Empire. But uh, there was an exchange of letters between him and the Persians and there were issues with Persian, the Persian Empire's persecution of Christians. There were a couple of Persian bishops who were at the Council of Nicaea. It's a whole thing. But so he was going to begin this campaign in the East. And his plan was that on his way to the East to begin to lead this military campaign, he was going to stop off to be baptized in the Jordan. Yeah, he wanted it where Jesus was baptized. Yeah. And the... Um, the then uh, bishop of uh, Alia Capitolina, <laughs> formerly known as Jerusalem, was going to be one of the participants who was baptizing him. Uh, it was going to be a big thing, right? So he he had this all planned, and then he got gravely ill. And so that campaign, at least under him, never happened. We're, we won't talk about Julian the Apostate, his Eastern campaign and what happened there. But um, so that campaign never happened. And so he ended up, because he was sick, they baptized him where he was, right? And and that it ended up being his deathbed, <laughs> right? Um, but that is because he got sick before the planned baptism. Yeah. And after... He received that what's sort of an emergency baptism. He refused to put back on the imperial garb and uh, refused to issue any more laws. Uh, He would only wear his white baptismal robe. Hmm. And so he spent his last days in repentance. So... All of this stuff goes into the understanding of him as St. Constantine, Hmm. right? And uh, yes, his life is very different than that of St. Seraphim of Sarov, right? (laughs) Or um, any number of other saints, right? Uh, But the saints live different lives. Yeah. Right? Yeah. uh, St. Constantine's a little more Old Testament saint, maybe, than, uh, than mm. he's definitely not a monastic saint, right? Uh, that's, but, um, yeah, yeah. So, through all of this, through how he conducts himself, right? Because, again, he's figuring this out. How does one be a Christian Roman emperor? Right? How does one going go from being the at least semi-divine, right? Possessed by a genius, right? (laughs) Semi-divine king and high priest of the Roman state to being a Christian emperor, ceding spiritual authority to other people, right? He's figuring out how to do this in his own life. But what he sort of figures out is the beginning of sort of the template, sort of the pattern for what a Byzantine emperor, what a czar later is supposed to be like and how they're supposed to function, right? Uh, Vis-a-vis the church. And so people may have heard the term symphonia, right? Speaking with the same voice that's used to describe the Byzantine emperor, the correct role between like the patriarch and the emperor. Um, And again, sometimes we read into that our idea of the separation of church and state, or even our idea of like sacred and secular spheres that are two different things. Um, And that's not really the distinction between the two and their authority. Right. So the actual distinction is for one thing, as we mentioned, the emperor cannot perform sacraments. Uh, including, as we mentioned with the collar, he's not supposed to perform his own coronation. <laughs> right? um, 
he's he he can't celebrate the Eucharist. He can't right do any of those things. That is not an authority right that he has. Uh, we talked about what the monarch's job is in the first half. Yep, yep. from the scriptures, establishing and maintaining justice. Right. And the proper functioning of communal life. Those are his authority serving as the icon of Christ. Right. In both senses. Right. So he has a ministry. He has a type of ministry, but it is not the same as the priestly ministry. Right. And so they function together in symphony. They are to function together in symphony in the same sense that a bishop and a priest and a deacon are supposed to function together in symphony. Right, those three have different ministries, but they should all be functioning together on the same page and speaking with the same voice. We're just adding in the monarch who has this other separate ministry, right? But which should be acting in concert, pun kind of intended, with the others, right? Um, and so now when we move into the third half. We will get into the sort of nitty gritty. We'll get to the actual topic and talk about the actual coronation of the emperor. Yeah. And then uh, after that sort of very practical side, we'll, we'll talk a little more about the way in which coming out of the New Testament, um, how all of this that we've been talking about informs our understanding of things like government and politics and those kind of things, oh which I'm sure will be super non-controversial with everyone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we will take a short break and we'll be right back with more Lord of Spirits. Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung will be back in a moment to take your calls on the next part of the Lord of Spirits. Give them a call at 855-237-237. 2346. That's 855 AF Radio. Ancient Faith Publishing is pleased to announce a new release that is part history, part theology, and part devotional. The Story of Jesus, a History and Theology of Christ, explores the complete life and teachings of our Lord from before his conception in Mary's womb until his ascension. Revered 20th century Egyptian elder and scholar Matthew the Poor wrote many volumes on the subject of Christ's significance, life, and teachings, which translator James Helmy has distilled into one highly readable book that will make a valuable addition to every Christian's library. The Story of Jesus is now available in paperback and ebook at store.ancientfaith.com. That's store.ancientfaith.com. We're back now with the Lord of Spirits, with Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung. If you have a question, call now at 855-237-2346. That's 855-AF-RADIO. Welcome back, everybody. It's the third half of the Lord of Spirits podcast, and we're talking about the making of kings. This is, continues our series on sacraments. This is sacrament number eight. Where will we end? I don't know. I really don't know. But not here. <laughs> not now. So, all right. Without ever knowing the way. Anyway. <laughs> no. Just... Where were they going? Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Well, we'll be talking now about someone, the road that he walks on is is not paved in gold, but he, he could have made that happen if he wanted to. Rich, yes. powerful guy. Um, so, uh, right. So in doing some of the research for this show, uh, we came across a really interesting text, which is called Russian Travelers to Constantinople in the 14th and 15th centuries, which, I mean, I mean, every kid should have this on his shelf and don't yours, yes. you know, everyone, most people they're Yeah, absolutely. We all read this in middle school, right? It's, it's not as exciting as Gulliver's Travels, I must say. That is true. So, but uh, more more pertinent to the life of the church than Gulliver's <laughs> Travels. A little bit more, yeah. Um, so the the editor is George P. Majeska. I don't know it's Ma, if, if it's Majeska or Majeska, but I want it to be Majeska. And um, so the 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 book is actually a collection of 
like it says on the label, you know, Russian travelers to Constantinople in the 14th, 15th centuries. And one of the travelers that he quotes, the he actually includes the source material, and then there's commentary and stuff, is a text called The Journey of Ignatius of Smolensk. And this is from the late 14th century. So this is getting towards the end of the Eastern Roman, a.k.a. Byzantine Empire, um, is when Ignatius of Smolensk makes this visit to Constantinople. One of the fun things about these travelers is that they go on these trips and then they write down the stuff that they saw. Often they are the only wit- the only people writing these texts um, that we have because sometimes the people who are living there don't ever bother, bother writing it down because like, well, everybody you know knows what, what happens or whatever. So anyways, um, right. what's so cool this, about- this we should ahead. we should be clear. Right. We just talked about St. Constantine. So he's the beginning of this. Right. So he, he didn't have a Christian coronation because he sort of right. became emperor. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. By inheritance and then conquest. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. I mean, this um, is like a thousand years later now, more than a thousand right. years. This later. is a thousand years later. This is the other end of the Byzantine Empire. So this is the, sort of the, f- the full flowering in terms of the, the, the right of coronation, in terms of this sacramental. Yes coronation right. of the emperor yeah um, and 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 so this one so he witnesses the coronation of manuel the second paleologos who is not the the ultimate emperor meaning the last he's not the penultimate emperor meaning next to last he is the anti-penultimate emperor <laughs> Next, next to last. You just wanted to use that word. That's all that was. About. I do not get to use that word every day. Um, so. Well, you need to you need to study Greek more That's because <laughs> then then you know because you define where you put the accent mark whether it's That's on true. the old the anti penult the penult or the anti penult. Yeah, it's yeah yeah. So uh, yeah, so he's number three from the end, and uh, he reigns from thirteen ninety one to fourteen twenty five. Um, so most of this is from Ignatius of Smolensk, but there are some other details from other sources included in this. So this is a rough outline of what his coronation actually would have looked like. Um, so before they start the coronation proper, um, stonemasons walk up to the emperor and they show him chunks of marble. I'm not kidding about this. They show him chunks of marble and they say to him, what sort of tomb will your majesty order for himself? Uh, the idea being like, you're going to die. So he, as he's about yep. to be crowned the most powerful guy <laughs> in the world, you're going to die. <laughs> right. So that, as Deuteronomy says, his heart will not exalt himself above his brethren. Yeah. Yeah. And so then there's this idea then, there's prayers that are said that he's going to establish a righteous empire. A righteous empire. The idea of establishing justice. Yeah. Right. So the patriarch of Constantinople and other clergy then they come out of the altar and they go up to the ambo, which is that uh, in, in most churches now is the space right, kind of right in front of the uh, the holy doors. Um, they go to the ambo and they invite the emperor to join join them, right? So he comes up and the patriarch reads a prayer for the success of the emperor's reign, and then he chants holy three times, holy, holy, holy. Right? So that sort of connects it right with the divine council, where we hear the thrice holy hymn. Um, the people then, they start chanting the holy over and over again. And while they do that, the patriarch anoints the head of the emperor with chrism in the form of a cross. And then, uh, so then after that happens, the crown of the emperor is brought out from the sanctuary, from the, you know, the, the holy place, or we, sometimes we call it the altar, uh, by two deacons. They bring the crown out. And then um, after that, then the empress's crown is brought out by relatives or by two eunuchs. I'm not sure whether there's eunuchs around, but there are eunuchs. Uh, <laughs> and um, they then escort her to the center of the church. So she's not up on the ambo where her husband is. She's in the, the out, out on the Solea away is probably kind of roughly the center of the church, up towards the front though still. And then... Um, this is an interesting detail, and I, I want to look this one up because I'm not really sure what this is about. But the patriarch first puts a hood on the emperor's head, and then he places the crown on it. And then he chants axios three times. So, I mean, it's looking a little bit like an ordination in some ways. Not yes. quite the same. Yeah. 
but it's similar. But they're clearly elements. He's he's yeah, he's receiving an office and a ministry. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then Ignatius of Smolensk says that the patriarch puts a cross in the emperor's hand. This is probably a scepter with a cross on top of it, right? So it's a cross scepter. And then the the patriarch and the emperor descend from the ambo to the Salea, which is where the empress is, right? And the emperor then crowns the empress. So you can see her her role is quite different. You know, she does not receive all this stuff from the patriarch, but it's her husband then who gives the, her the crown. And who then shares emperor, it with her. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of like a presbytera. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and so then the emperor then places a gold wand decorated with gems into her hand. So it's kind of a scepter, but not quite the same thing. And then the emperor and the empress then go back to their thrones and the deacons intone acclamations for the royal family. God grant you many years. And that's that's the, the order, basically, as Ignatius of Smolensk, with some details from other sources um, that uh, this scholar has put together for us. That's essentially the, the order of the coronation of an emperor with the anti-penultimate <laughs> emperor yes. before, the, uh, before the fall of Constantinople. Yes. And this is during the liturgy, if I'm correct. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so then, as with many... Sacraments, there is sort of a culmination in the reception of the Eucharist. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. By the uh, the Emperor and uh and Empress. Yeah, which we will Empress. uh we will get to. We'll get to that. And uh, people will be puzzled and dismayed. But uh you'll make it. It'll be great. We'll stay with you. <laughs> We're here we'll, for we'll you. Be, we'll we'll be ruining both sort of Sunday school and all the things that the Babushki <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell you at the yeah, back told of the you. church. Yeah. Um, so, um, <laughs> right. So here we have clearly expressed within the ritual, right, and those connections to an ordination, right. That that again, there's this ministry, there's this office being received by the emperor. Uh, but that is not again just something that grows out of. Uh, the practical matters of St. Constantine and and the emperors thereafter. Uh, this is something that has its root back in St. Paul, uh, specifically in what St. Paul says about the governing authorities, which, of course, in his day was the Roman Empire and the Roman emperor. A pagan, um, pagan, yes, pagan the emperor. pagan ones, the pagan ones yeah. who are persecuting the church, yeah, um, beginning to at least, um, who had killed Christ, right? Um, <laughs> uh, Romans uh, 13, specifically verses one through seven, okay, uh, where he talks about this. Yeah, I'm gonna read this off. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain." For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Right. Um, so you see a couple elements there. One is we were just referring to that the civil magistrate, right? In this case, the Roman authorities are God's servants. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> that's, and that the power, including the power of the sword, which is what a Roman emperor later had St. Paul killed with. Uh, is given to them by God, right? And so we see this element. That's the one side, 
right, of the ruler as icon and as mm. minister. And then St. Paul goes to the other side, right, which is that veneration and honor, right, and obedience, which is owed to the other way. Again, not based on the goodness or <laughs> right anything, any other qualities of the particular ruler, but the fact that they are the person who is in this position of God-given authority. Right. And this mostly a lot of the majority, I wish all Orthodox people had this understanding with clergy, right? That that the respect that we pay to a bishop or to a priest or a deacon, right, uh, is not based on their personal qualities, but based on the office they've received from God, that God is the person who will judge them and deal with them regarding how they've used that office and authority they've been granted. St. Paul is saying the same kind of thing is true of the governmental authorities, because hmm. they also have this office from God and this responsibility from God. And this is St. Paul's position that he, that he takes here is over against uh, the increasingly popular array of Jewish positions at this time toward the Roman government that generally get categorized as zealotry. Um. St. Paul has his own period of zealotry against the church, right? But it's not the quote-unquote political zealotry that, for example, is going to lead to the Jewish revolts that are going to get Jerusalem destroyed, right? Um, there are, of course, three Jewish revolts, but much like the original Matrix trilogy, everybody <laughs> only wants to talk about the first one, and they get worse as they go. Um <laughs> But so, and this is this is so common. We we see this reflected, right? Two of Christ's disciples, Saint Simon the Zealot, obviously is labeled as a zealot. But this is also actually what Iscariot seems to mean in reference to Judas. Yeah, uh, that he was one of the Sicarii uh, who were an extremely militant zealot group that literally spent their time assassinating Roman officials. Yeah. Look this up, people. They carried around deck. <laughs> uh, yes. So they were kind of ready at any time to stick it in some guy's yeah. back. When they got the opportunity to kill yeah. a Roman, they took it. Yeah. Yeah. So Judas might have been one of these people. Yeah. It seems like, seems most likely that that's what that's referring to. Um, Man. So, uh, this position is increasingly popular. This is why Christ gets asked whether it's lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. Hmm. Right? Because there are, from extreme militancy, right, murderous militancy, all the way to people who become tax collectors who are complete collaborators, right? <laughs> this range of, of positions within occupied, right, Judea and Galilee at this time. And... St. Paul takes the position we outlined. And for St. Paul, that doesn't mean just like slavish obedience, right? So when the Roman authority says no more preaching the gospel, he's still going to preach the gospel. Yeah, right. He has, right? You have to obey God rather than man. Right. But what it does mean, his position does mean, is that then he will voluntarily accept the consequences of that. Yeah. If you're including resist- ultimately... Yeah. Death. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to resist the yeah. government, you don't complain. You accept whatever happens right. to you. Right. Yeah. And so when that means he gets executed, he goes to his execution and becomes a martyr. Right. Right. He, he doesn't try and get people to break him out. He doesn't. Right. <laughs> That's, um, so uh, I think in part, this position that St. Paul takes is influenced by his past. He was born and spent his early years in Tarsus. And at one point after his conversion, not immediately after when he went to Arabia, but after, went back to Tarsus for a period of time, probably at least a couple of years. 
And Tarsus is an interesting city and community. We won't spend too much time on it right now. But what's primarily interesting about it in this regard is that during the whole contest, so Tarsus is kind of in the crook where Asia Minor, what's now Turkey, meets the Levant, right? Like what's now Lebanon, right? Like in the crook there. And it's at the mouth of a river. Um, So it's kind of centrally located there and became this strategic position. Uh, so like Antony and Cleopatra mustered their troops there for the battle of Actium, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, in this regard, what's important is during the, the rivalry between, uh, Caesar and, and Pompey, uh, Tarsus and its surroundings, including its very large Jewish community were deeply loyal to Caesar, to Julius Caesar. And, uh, when they did that, Caesar took notice of it, and he made uh, Tarsus a free city, uh, which gave them a bunch of tax exemptions and other things. Um, and he issued a mass grant of citizenship, uh, not only to uh, the officials in the city itself, but also to the prominent members of the large Jewish community who were his supporters uh, in the area. This is how St. Paul ended up being a Roman citizen, right? He tells when he's arrested in Jerusalem in in Acts, he tells the centurion that uh, he received his citizenship by birth, which means likely his grandfather based on the timing was one of these Jews at the time who received Roman citizenship from Caesar. Hmm. And then you're able to give that to your descendants. Um, and the, the prominence of the support from this Jewish community is what led to the toleration of Judaism, not only in the area, but ultimately in the whole Roman empire. Wow. This is why, the Jews were relatively – I mean, there were always issues. Caligula was crazy, tried to put a statue of himself in the Temple of Jerusalem, right? There were things, right? But on the whole – and Claudius expelling the Jews from Rome. But on the whole, Jewish communities scattered around the Roman Empire could gen- were generally exempt from having to engage in pagan sacrifice, from having to do these things. They were able to sort of live out their own lives within the larger community, keeping Torah, right? Um, but so that, that's the way of life that St. Paul experienced as a very young man. And then again, later in life. And so he had seen an example. I think this colored his view of the Gentiles and the Romans in general too. He had seen that they were not entirely unreasonable. They were not animals. He had seen that if one was willing to give honor and respect to authority, not 100%, but a lot of the time, you would be allowed to, as he says in the pastoral epistles, live a quiet and peaceful life in godliness and sanctity, right? Mm. You pay your taxes, you know, you meet your obligations, you show the respect that these people deserve, and they basically leave you alone, right? And so that seems to have colored his position, because that's sort of the position he takes for Christians of how Christians should try to live in this pagan world, right, is the same kind of thing. Give respect to who it's due, pay your taxes, right, do good in your community, right, and and uh, good things will, will follow, or at least they'll mostly leave you alone, right? Um, but uh, St. Paul also had a game plan. This is also very clear, both in Acts and in his epistles. And the culmination of that game plan, the, the, the end game of it, was uh, that he wanted to preach the gospel to and convert the emperor. Yeah, he's always trying to get there. Yeah, trying to get to Rome. And when he gets arrested, he's like, well, I'll appeal my way there, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Here's my chance. <laughs> um, and and we know while he's under house arrest, you know, ultimately he's in Rome. He's he's talking to, he's got members of Caesar's household and stuff who he's talking to. Right, he's trying to get that audience. He's trying to 
to uh, bring the emperor to Christ, right? Um, and for part of that time that he's thinking that, you've got emperors like Caligula and Nero, right? <laughs> so these aren't like nice people or sane people. Um, he's essentially trying to convert the Antichrist to Christianity, right? <laughs> like he's trying to um, – Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this guy who has proclaimed himself a god, right? This guy who is um, – and he's going to try and get him to become a Christian. So uh, what happens with St. Constantine when he converts, right, is St. Paul's plan coming to fruition. This is, again, not this radical thing that the apostles never could have conceived of, right? They very much could conceive of it. Right, maybe not of everything that would happen afterwards, but they could conceive of a, a world in which that could happen, and that if that happened, how much of the world would then become Christian, and how would the world change, and how would idolatry cease? Right. So th this is very much in tune with uh, the first century gospel. So there's not this great uh, disjunction. Right, that that almost all of those conspiracy theories and a bunch of others we didn't mention are based on that Christianity right. was going in this one direction and then Constantine comes and derails it and takes it in this other direction. This was the direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now all that said, all that said, now's the big letter. I know out there. <laughs> yes, I know out there. There's a whole bunch of folks who identify as monarchists who got super excited that we were going to be talking about Saint Constantine and the coronation of the emperor. Okay, we got to talk, guys. <laughs> um, Huddle up. You may have noticed there aren't actually really any more monarchies. Not in the sense we've been talking about anymore in our yeah. world today. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, a, there's a handful like, you know, like Brunei and Oman, <laughs> you know, Saudi yeah. Arabia. Like, these are not even Christian that, monarchs. <laughs> right. They're not Christian monarchs. Well, so you've got, on one hand, you've got countries who still have royal families as sort of figureheads. Right. Um, that's not to say they don't have certain social and cultural roles and responsibilities, but just in the sense that they're not actually governing the state, right? <laughs> That's right. So soon to be, I don't know, is he soon to be King Charles III or is he King Charles III? I don't know. I, he gets he coordinated like Charles, 15 times. Yeah, he is King Charles, but the, the, the crowning <laughs> okay. doesn't happen until uh, sometime in May, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, or, you know, the current king of the Netherlands who's named Willem, like almost all the other ones. Um, <laughs> hey, right? if it works, it works. You have people who are essentially dictators, like some of those people you just mentioned, um, where there's no sacramental character to what they're doing. Right. Right. There's no, there, there's no, you know, there, there's a big difference between Stalin and the czar, right? <laughs> like both, both of them in a certain sense had absolute power, but uh, not really doing the same thing. Right. Um, even a bad czar was doing a fundamentally different thing. He was just doing it badly. Um, or, uh, you know, very common now, especially the West, is you have councils with no king. Congresses and parliaments and, right? Um, and the current situation in almost all of these places is the result of a series of revolts and revolutions, most of them bloody. Yeah. Uh, and and violent, right? And, you know, so it's not that we sort of have peacefully evolved to a higher place than monarchy. It's, you know, blood-soaked history of kings getting murdered and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, again, um, I hate to tell everybody, but uh, in the real world... It's not coming back in our lifetime. Wah, but we're not going to end on a depressing wah. note like that. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to end on a depressing note like that. Um, 
so what right <laughs> we 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 don't have monarchy we definitely don't have a sacramentally coronated emperor or king uh who's the head of, who's the actual head of state the functioning head of state um so can we just scrap this episode why did we bother doing it is it just a <laughs> historical curiosity right uh for nerds um no uh and yes i know i know that in like 38,000 years we'll have a god emperor but i won't be around <laughs> then <laughs> but it'll be um, half half you know gigantic worm or whatever so uh, i was no i was i was anyway <laughs> wrong franchise <laughs> I um i did i understand <laughs> so um so <laughs> So, but we do still have a civil magistrate, right? We do right. still have people in various governmental positions of authority. What can we take from this and apply it to them? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going to start at a place and I want to be clear before we start at this place. Uh, that we're about to talk about how the emperor and the empress received the Eucharist. We are not saying that your local government officials should receive the Eucharist this way with their wives or husbands. Even if they're Orthodox. Just to be clear. Even if they're Orthodox. We're not saying you should do this. But we're going to look at this and then we're going to take some lessons from this. Yes. Okay. Okay. So as we mentioned, right, that sort of the culmination of that service that that Father Andrew read through and described is when they receive the Eucharist. Yeah. So the way that this works is – during the cherubic hymn in the divine liturgy. So, you know, this is when the clergy and the altar servers are about to make the procession um, of the, you know, of the unconsecrated bread and wine into the sanctuary. So during the cherubic hymn, the emperor enters into the sanctuary through the holy doors, a.k.a. the royal doors, although... This is one of my little bugaboos. Those are not the royal doors. Um, royal doors are in the back of the church. The emperor anyway. just walked through them. That was pretty. That was well, pretty royal. It's true. It's true. But but the, <laughs> anyway. But yeah. So touche. In, touche. He enters, touche. Yeah. He enters into the doors that are at the center of the iconostasis. So he's, you know, walking straight up to the altar. Um, and um, and his wife, she enters through one of the deacon's doors. The south so door. she walks right up into the, one the he altar. used to enter. Yeah, yeah. Um, Spit takes across the country. <laughs> That's right. As it's people just heard that ceremonial entrance of the empress into the holy place. Yes, yes. Behind okay. the altar, and you know who got really mad about this, and it started all their problems. Nestorius. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Second time he's come up. Wow. He got mad about the emperor's coming coming and receiving communion in the sanctuary. And she defended herself by saying, well, the Theotokos entered into the temple. Mic drop. But please don't. And went into the Holy of Holies. And Nestorius, rather than just saying touche, said, uh, you should call her Theotokos. And it all went south from there. Yes. So when they Um, go in, when they go in, the emperor gets a little felonian put on him. So, you know, all you young men in the Slavic traditions, when you become readers, uh, you're being vested like the emperor for like a hot minute. Um, but yes, the emperor gets a little felonian. Do not him. exalt your heart above your brothers. Indeed. Yes, that's right. Um, and they hand him a censer. And the emperor stands at the altar, next to the altar, and uh, he senses while the clergy bring the bread and the wine into the altar. So he's sensing as they come. At the great entrance. Yeah. Yeah, at the great entrance. Yep, yep. Um, And so then fast forward a bit into in the liturgy. um, When it's time for communion, the emperor, he receives the Eucharist. From the patriarch. Notice he does not go get it himself. He receives it from the patriarch. 
and he communes along with all the clergy. So he communes at the altar with the clergy. And then the empress is communed within the sanctuary. So she's she's there, she's inside the holy place, but she's not like at the altar with the clergy, but she's communed within. Um, and so that's how the emperor and the empress, at least at this later Byzantine period, received holy communion. Right. And again, we're not saying that you right. should do this with your right. local mayor and his wife or her husband. Right. Um, right. But... Right. What does this once again emphasize? Right. That this is a, an an office and a ministry. Right. That is the key element that this is emphasizing. Right. They, they're not communing as laity. They're communing as, right, as people with offices from God within the church. And so even though, again, we do not communicate our civil magistrates this way. Um, this idea that the authority that the civil magistrate has, whether he's the mayor, whether he's the tax assessor, whether he's the president of the United States, whether he's the prime minister, uh, is given to them by God. Right? They are, in a sense, a minister of God with responsibilities. Right? to promulgate, again, not their own will, but the law and commandments of God, and to serve as image in those two senses, right? That they are to image the rule of Christ over the earth, right, by how they conduct their office, and they are honored, they are venerated by us, Right, as those who have been given the authority to do that, we pay them the respect they are due, even when they're lousy. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, again, again, see David and Saul. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, so, right. Even if Joe Biden comes to kill me, I will say, Why are you coming here to murder me, Mr. President? Don't you have better things to do? Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but meanwhile, welcome to Louisiana. Would you like some? some yeah. <laughs> Um, so, um, now that said, right, that, that sort of gives us at least a little flavor of a relevance for all this, right? Even if we aren't really currently, and as I said, within our lifetimes, we're not going to really practice this, this sacrament, this mystery of the church, um, there's still an issue, um, and this issue I want to at least point out, um, because this is something the church has not done yet. And I think part of the reason the church hasn't done this yet is that, um, the Orthodox church. So it's only been a little over a hundred years since, uh, Russia had an emperor. Yeah. And they were under communism for most of that. Right. Um, vast swaths uh, of uh, the Orthodox Church are under Islamic governments, right? Um, so the Orthodox Church does not have a long history of living in liberal democracies, right? This is a relatively recent thing for us. And... Um, since the fall of Constantinople, uh, modernity rising has generally been greeted by kind of apocalypticism by a lot of Orthodox <laughs> sources, right? Um, yeah. So there hasn't been a lot of attention given to how do we function long term in this new structuring of the world because, you know, the fact that we have this new structuring of the world was taken to be a clear sign that it was about to end, right? Well, yeah. Assuming it doesn't end in my lifetime, which of course it could, right? Um, we have to figure out how to function. And there's a – living in a dem democratic – I won't say a democracy, really. It's a democratic system, right? Republican system, whatever you know, we want to strictly call it. Um, the kind of democratic system presents a fundamental puzzle to Christian ethics, and Christian social ethics that we haven't really paid much attention to. 
Yeah, so we're still for kind reasons of working through that this. I just described, right? And yeah. what do I mean by that? Well, in a sense, right? If you're you're voting on things, right? If you're in some cases directly, more often indirectly, in a sort of representative sense, right? Uh, voting on issues that that means every person is a magistrate of sorts. So we all should be being right. communed up inside the altar. No, well, <laughs> not what we're saying. No, um, that's right. We everyone, <laughs> yeah, but it's sort of everyone is and no one is, right? <laughs> like, but yeah. uh, clearly, there's a fundamental difference between me and the president of the United States or the prime minister of the UK. Yeah, right. In terms of right. functioning as a magistrate, even though like there are ballot propositions in Louisiana that I can vote on, and if they win the vote, they go into force of law, right? Um, so it, that's a different structure, right? And the whole structure of rights, right? So let me give an example. There's a whole question, right? Should a Christian vote? People come down on different sides of this, right? Like, um, should I vote at all, <laughs> right? If if the available candidates who theoretically could win the election are all problematic, should I not? Should I not vote? What if that's always kind of true? Should I just never vote? Um, or is there some kind of responsibility? Does that being a magistrate of a sort mean that I have a responsibility to exercise that power, which would, of course, have come from God? And therefore, do I, am I, should I vote? Do I have a, a, a duty to go and vote and, and exercise that power in some sense, right? This is not something that has been fully thought through in terms of the Orthodox tradition. Um. And part of the reason for that is like when the United States government was found, it was deliberately designed after the pre-Christian Roman Republic. Right. Um, and then if we do conclude that you either should or at least can or it's indifferent for you to vote, theological approach, how do you vote? Right? Yeah, um, because because like – you know, you vote for a candidate, um, or you know, maybe you can vote for much more narrowly, like a a, a referendum, a proposition, you know, a proposition or something like or that, or a party, or depending or on your party. system, yeah, right, and and um, maybe you can endorse some of the things that'll happen as a result, could happen as a result of that vote, and some things that you cannot endorse, or again, you know, there's the problem of. Uh, what if you vote for someone and then they do something other than what they said they were going to do? Are you responsible for that? Because you helped put them in power, right? Um, so, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's it's complicated from a Christian ethical point of view. Um, and at least in mo for most of the people listening to this, maybe not all, but for most of the people listening to this, there's not uh, somebody or a party you could go vote for whose platform is Orthodox Christianity. Yeah, no. No. <laughs> right. Um, so this is a whole complex series of issues. Right. Um, that we still need to wrestle with and still need to sort out. Um, but we can take an overall approach. Uh, so... Within, for example, the, the Christianized Roman Empire, uh, the Christian Roman Empire, what did, you know, clergy and people do, especially a good example is when they had bad emperors, right? When they had, were under one of the bad ones, right? And what you see is you see a veneration of the office. You see honor and respect being given. You see the pattern by St. Paul. And then you see uh, the clergy and the church as a whole and even the laity then exhorting those people who find themselves in power to govern rightly, to govern righteously, to govern with justice, right? And that approach at least is one that we can directly take regardless of our system of government, right? Yeah. That we could both be respectful of the authorities, keep the laws, 
until up to and until they conflict with God's law and uh, to continue to exhort those who are in power to uh, utilize the responsibilities they've invested with the authority and power they've been vested with by God uh, in the manner that God has called them to use it. Amen. All right. Well, we're here at the end. Um, so I have so many thoughts about a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of what you, where you could kind of go with this. Um, I, I think that one of the biggest temptations, um, I, I think particularly for people who convert to the Orthodox Christian faith and discover at least even some piece of all the stuff we've just been talking about with regards to emperors and kings and stuff, is to like really want that. Wow, it looks great. It's so glorious and shiny, you know. Um, despite the fact that, of course, the vast majority of even Orthodox Christian monarchs were not great, you know. Uh, and sometimes people pine for monarchy, and it's like, well, you know, um, number one, that's not going to happen, like you just said. But, but also, like, you know, most of us, most people living under a monarchy, are not the important people. <laughs> most people are living way down at the bottom. Right. Um, and, you know, that can be for our salvation. Um, but I think that the vast majority of uh, Orthodox Christians or any Christians or whoever is listening to this uh, are not pining for, <laughs> for monarchy, you know, are not monarchists, are not ideologues along these, these, these lines. Um, most are probably just asking the question of, like, well, how am I supposed to understand all this and how am I supposed to make sense of the fact that? Uh, largely speaking, most of these monarchs have not been good people um, or even decent people in a lot of cases. What are you supposed to do with that? Um, you know, I, I think one of the things that, um, as I've studied history over the course of my life, that I've discovered, and, and I think particularly in the last several years as I've made a deep study of some, some particular times and places of history, is that you, you kind of have two choices of where you can land in terms of being a Christian and reading this kind of stuff and trying to understand it. One is that you can become very cynical and certainly people do, right? That often there's a pretty bad track record. Um, and I mean, you know, you don't even have to just look at kings and queens and emperors and empresses. You can even just look at clergy. Uh, there's often a pretty bad track record. So that's one way you can become cynical. You can say it's all just bunk or, you know, forget it. I've had enough. Um, but the other way is the way that I, I prefer and the one that I think is actually the Christian way, honestly, which is to look at all of it with hope. Hope. And our hope is in the king of kings, right? The scripture at the same time that it says put not your trust in princes or in sons of men, also says all these things about good kingship. But it's not to say that even David is the end, is you know the, the point at which all of this has become what it's supposed to be. Because not even he, who's a man after God's own heart, not even he was the one that all kingship was pointing towards. That's Christ. Christ is the one. And so our hope is not a hope in any particular government system. It's not a hope in the rise of a pious, saintly, holy, orthodox emperor. That's, that's not what it is. And, and honestly, I mean, I had this thought a number of times when we were preparing for this episode, which is, you know, let's imagine here in America that there's a king. What kind of king would America generate? I... Probably most of us would not want her to live under that king. Not great. Um, so, you know, that aside, though, um, the, the point of all this is to point us towards Christ. And so um, what do you do in the meantime? I think one of the things that you discover, especially as you study church history in particular, is that while there is the grand game of power and borders and territories and riches and all this kind of stuff, 
while that is always going on in this life, there is a more important story that is also going on. And it's not that these two stories have nothing to do with each other. They have everything to do with each other. But it is that the story of the saints who are sort of the through line of all of this, that is going to be revealed at the end of time as the story of those who are, in a sense, really ruling, right? It's the saints who, as the scripture says, judge angels, to whom the world to come is subjected, right? They're the ones co-reigning with Christ, and they show us what that looks like by by doing it. You know, what does it look like for the saints to to reign in glory? It looks like what they're doing for us right now. You know, they are intercessors for us before the throne of God. They also help to to minister and to manage this creation um, in concert with God. And um, the more that you look at even the very, very dark chapters of history, I think the more, and if you look at it really, really honestly and, and seek out the face of Christ in this, uh, then you will see that there's always hope. Sometimes it feels kind of buried, but there is always hope. There's always hope. And if we look at history and if we look at, um, you know, questions of, of kingship and monarchy and government with triumphalism, then it, it's going to go very dark. It's, it's going to get super dark because that's really about power. But if we look at it with hope, then we're looking for Christ because he is our hope. He is the hope of the hopeless, right? The savior of the storm tossed. And um, I think that's the way that many of us, especially especially at this point right now in American history in particular, again, I know that lots of our listeners are not Americans, but, but, but most of y'all are, uh, and certainly in other parts of the world too, so even if you're not American, that it can feel pretty hopeless. It can feel pretty storm-tossed. There's a lot of nutty stuff going on, dangerous stuff, despairing stuff, depressing stuff, and yet we always have our hope in Christ. Always, always. Above all other people, Christians should be joyful. And our joy is possible because Christ is king. He also has, you know, sub-kings under him. And in as much as our government officials are showing that as icons, thank God. We still need to honor them and respect them and obey them uh, in as much as they don't tell us to disobey God. Um, but ultimately, it's the saints who are really those co-reigners with Christ. And everything points finally to him. Father Stephen? So there's a sort of unique paradox in contemporary life, which is that at the same time, everything is hyper-political and everything is apolitical. And what I mean by that, we, we may be more aware of the hyper-political side, right? Um, all of a sudden, where you buy a chicken sandwich and uh, <laughs> who gets cast as the Little Mermaid is, is a political act of some sort. Um, everything, every movie that comes out, every TV show that comes out, every announcement of anything, any opinion, any performance, any song, any anything – uh, is folded into a weird partisan politics thing. Uh, at the same time, though, uh, really things are completely apolitical because none of that continued churn of lining up on either side of literally everything ever produces any change in the world ever has any kind of actual effect on anyone's real life. Um, and it churns through so quickly that we, we can't even remember half of these things, right? Like, you know, the, 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 the profound angst over like the Captain Marvel movie. Anybody remember that? Um, 
this was something we needed to argue about before anybody even saw it. Um, now nobody cares. Um, and on the apolitical side, you know, when you look at people's social media, everybody sort of identifies as things. There are all of these sort of political labels, right? Um, some of the folks who got really excited about this episode might label themselves monarchists. You got people out there who are, you know, anarcho-capitalists. You got people out there who are anarcho-primitivists who dream of living in the woods with a rock or something. Um, you've got people like me who are radical anti-centrists. You've got Marxist, Leninist, Maoist tankies, right? You've got all these people who put all these labels on themselves and sort of performatively issue these statements on social media as their quote unquote political identity, but it's just sort of an identity. It's sort of, you know, like being a jock or a stoner or a goth in high school, right? Like you, you put this thing on yourself or, or if you're, if you've decided to identify with more mainstream politics, right, you repost things and you line up on either side of everything, but none of that has anything to do with what politics actually is. If you go back to, as is my want, say Aristotle's politics, right? Politics is just the ethics of life and community together. And we may not be able to recreate in our present day the kind of biblical and traditional model that we described in today's episode, but we can certainly exercise uh, Christian, uh, I don't want to say morality, but Christian ethics, right? A Christian way of life, a Christian way of being in the world. Um, we could follow the teachings of the Orthodox Church and the way of life that the Orthodox Church represents in community with each other. The biggest barrier to that right now is not that the Christian ethic is so hard to follow or not that we don't love and care about the other people who go to our church. It's that we aren't actually living communal lives at all. We're all isolated, signaling our respective stances on things performatively on social media. Uh, we're all sort of consuming media and or chicken sandwiches to indicate where we stand on things and that we're a good person and not one of those bad people. And we're not engaging with each other. But there's also nothing stopping us from doing that in the sense that uh, no one is going to physically halt us from going down to the church, to staying there and talking to people, to helping people there who need help visiting with each other in each other's houses, spending time together, addressing issues in that community, addressing issues in the broader community around us. I'm not talking about whole nations. I'm not even necessarily talking about whole cities. It might just be neighborhoods. It might just be, hey, you know what? A lot of trash gets left on our street. Why don't we go out and pick it up together and spend time together doing that? And maybe while we're out there, we'll actually meet some of the other people who live next door to us and who live in our area who we've never talked to and we don't know their names. And maybe when we talk to them and they talk to us, maybe they might become part of our community and our church community. And maybe we can start to transform this thing. And, and maybe that's what politics actually is, at least what Christian politics actually is. And those things can start small in a few places. They can actually grow very quickly. Places could be transformed very quickly. And before you know it, the world we live in, maybe not the world out there, maybe not the world that's funneled to us by cable news and through the internet and over social media, but the world we actually live in once we go out and start living there in community can be very transformed and very different. And we could feel very different about it and about our lives. And we can feel a sense of connection that we've lost. Right? And even if we don't have 
a single human king to represent Christ to us in terms of the civil authority. There are all kinds of people in our community who have leadership qualities, who have expertise in different areas, who can both represent Christ and the way of life in Christ to us, and who are worthy of our respect in return. So even though this is a sacrament we've just described that, as I already said, probably no one listening to this is going to get to participate in during our lifetimes. The fundamental reality of it, the work of God that it represents in our communities and our communal life is something we can at least taste when we take seriously the fact that we're living together and that we want the life that we live together to be one of good order, of holiness, of righteousness, and therefore of justice. Amen. All right. Well, that is our show for tonight. Thank you for listening, everyone. If you didn't happen to call us live this time, we'd still love to hear from you. You can email us at lordofspirits at ancientfaith.com. You can message our Facebook page. You can also leave us a voicemail at speakpipe.com slash Lord of Spirits. And join us for our live broadcasts on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific, even if you are the King of Rock and there is none higher. If you're on Facebook, follow our page, join our discussion group, leave reviews and ratings everywhere, but most importantly, share this show with a friend whom you know is going to love it. And finally, be sure to go to ancientfaith.com stroke support and help make sure we and lots of other AFR podcasters stay on the R, even if Sucka MCs call you sire. Everyone, please read W.B. Yeats' The Old Stone Cross. Thank you, good night, and God bless you. You've been listening to The Lord of Spirits with Orthodox Christian priests, Father Andrew Stephen Damick and Father Stephen DeYoung, a listener-supported presentation of Ancient Faith Radio. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 12.